preface of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by chuck williamson your psychic powers and how to develop them by hereward carrington preface the following book your psychic powers and how to develop them was originally written for circulation semi-privately among the members of a number of psychical and spiritualistic societies in new york and vicinity and is for that reason decidedly positive and spiritualistic in tone it states facts dogmatically and does not attempt to defend the statements made by any show of argument the reader is asked to bear in mind throughout the following one that the present work does not necessarily represent my own views in all respects but rather the teachings which are generally accepted regarding the facts that is to say i have merely endeavored to state the traditional and accepted theories without in all cases endorsing these views myself two for this reason those who might be apt to criticize certain views advanced in this book and brand them as rankly credulous quacky or spiritualistic are hereby warned that they are deprived of that weapon for the simple reason that as before said the teachings put forward do not in every case represent my own views but the traditional and accepted ones which are more or less prevalent in psychical and spiritualistic circles and i have been careful in nearly all such cases to state that it is taught or we are told or words to that effect i have summarized these teachings and the reader must use his own judgment in selecting those which appeal to his reason and common sense while attempting to follow them and while developing his own psychic powers so much evidence has been accumulated of late years tending to prove the persistence of individual human consciousness after death and i have tentatively and for the sake of argument adopted the spiritualistic hypothesis throughout the present work i have assumed that a spiritual world exists and that it is possible at certain times and under certain conditions to get into touch with that world through the instrumentality of certain peculiarly endowed individuals known as psychics or mediums the fact once granted innumerable interesting possibilities present themselves as well as many phenomena which call for solution i have endeavored in this present volume to offer tentative theories and explanations of such facts and to make plain what might conceivably happen once the main theory were accepted it is with these thoughts in mind that i have spoken of spirits throughout as actually existing and communicating this at least is the appearance of the phenomena psychical research seems to be tending more and more towards an acceptance of the spiritualistic interpretation of the facts and it is because of this and with the possibility of the ultimate acceptance of this interpretation that i have adopted throughout the present volume tentatively as before said and for the sake of argument the correctness of the spiritualistic view and have proceeded throughout upon this assumption whatever the ultimate interpretation of the phenomena may prove to be 
this is it seems to me at least warranted by the newer researches and conclusions in this field it must be distinctly understood however that i believe the vast bulk of the material contained in this book to be sound and helpful the practical instructions are good and the reader cannot go far wrong in following them i at least wish his success in his efforts may he develop his own psychic powers and gain light and understanding thereby h c end of preface chapter one of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. By Harroward Carrington. Chapter 1. How to Develop. Every student of psychics, everyone who has experienced phenomena of one kind or another, or who is more or less mediumistic, desires to know how to develop his own powers and faculties so that the phenomena which come through him may be increased in power in clearness and in excellence it is quite possible to ensure this since we are all more or less mediumistic or psychic and need only to cultivate our powers in order to develop them and bring them into maturity development may differ according to the character of the phenomena we desire those who desire physical phenomena must develop in one way those who desire to obtain automatic writing must develop in another and those who wish to become clairvoyant must develop in still another and so on spontaneous phenomena to begin let me give a few general hints to those who have experienced spontaneous phenomena in their waking state or who have experienced remarkable dreams which they feel signify something but just what they do not understand. These spontaneous phenomena are often the simplest types of mediumship, though as a matter of fact they are also an indication of psychic power, having but little to do with true mediumistic messages, that is, they are the result of remarkable powers within ourselves. All who obtain phenomena of this nature should make it a point, first of all, to maintain the physical health at the highest possible standard, so that the energies are not drained, and the body remains healthy and the mind clear in its judgment. It is essential to reduce the amount of stimulants which may be taken to the lowest possible quantity, or if possible, omit them altogether. This applies not only to alcohol and all its forms, but also to tea and coffee. These stimulants excite the nerves and the imagination and often induce manifestations which are not true psychic phenomena at all, but merely the results of a disordered nervous system. The subject should not eat too much meat. On the other hand, fruits of all kinds, particularly acid fruits such as the pear, peach, plum, orange, and lemon, are especially suitable, since the juices of these fruits act upon the liver and tend to cleanse the blood. Of course, these precautions are only for those who are serious in their study, and who are determined to obtain the best possible phenomena. The mind should be exercised in all healthy channels. Do not introspect or reflect too much on your own inner mental conditions. You must learn to live outside of your head, so to speak, in the outer world. Do not constantly wonder what is going on within your own brain. If you do, you will surely lead yourself into difficulties later on. In short, you should lead a healthy, active life, and between those times when you experience phenomena, you should think about them as applied to yourself as little as possible. Conditions for Development If you desire to obtain certain manifestations, it is not advisable to sit for them or try to obtain them for longer than twenty minutes to half an hour each day. At first five or ten minutes would suffice, and this time can gradually be lengthened as you progress. 
This is especially important, and the neglect of this rule is one of the great reasons for the dangers which mediums experience later on in their development. Suppose, for example, that someone appeared to you and gave you certain advice as to your course of action. It would certainly be unwise for you to follow this advice in every case without inquiring whether or not it would be just and sensible, and without using your own judgment when the advice was given. Even supposing that the person who appeared to you were really the spirit it claimed to be, there is always the possibility that this spirit may be mistaken, and the further possibility that some malicious and lying spirit is coming to you, pretending to give advice, while in reality it was only leading you astray. There is this further possibility that the figure you saw was not really a spirit at all, but merely the product of your own subconscious imagination. Often this is the case, and yet the figure has given true and sound advice. All that we are saying now is that the judgment of the individual who receives such messages or advice must always be exercised upon the message received. If you do not cultivate this habit, you will find that messages often become more and more insistent when they are not followed, and will sometimes give untrue or lying information. They may even urge you to do certain things which are against your own welfare. All this can only be settled by the exercise of right judgment, and by the advice of those who know how much to believe in the messages. It is for this reason that the counsel and help of one who has had long training and experience in this subject is most desirable during these early stages of mediumship. The Proper Formation of the Circle The proper formation of the circle is of the utmost importance and upon it depends the excellence of the phenomena, and whether or not helpful personalities are drawn into your aura and environment. The best results may be obtained by closely obeying the following rules. From six to ten persons usually constitute a circle. They should range on the average from twenty to fifty years of age. Of these, half should be gentlemen and half ladies, they should sit alternately around a table, or around the room in the case one of the party enters the cabinet. It is desirable to join hands in order to form a battery, so called, and the feet should be kept flat on the floor. The circle should not last more than two hours, and not less than half an hour. An invocation, or short, earnest prayer, should begin the proceedings, followed by slow and quiet music which may or may not be accompanied by singing, according to the expressed wish of the controls, or the experience of those forming the circle. The light should be subdued, but absolute darkness should not be permitted, unless strict instructions are given to that effect. Avoid dark seances, if possible, at all times. The Value of Flowers It is advisable to have flowers in the seance room, whenever possible as their presence is said to attract spirits in a peculiar manner. The spirits say that these flowers are lights. Plenty of fresh air should be allowed to enter the seance room. If any member of the circle be ill, he or she should not be permitted to sit in the circle until well again. A developing circle should meet in the same room, since this room tends to become mediumized or soaked in the magnetic influences given off by the sitters. The chairs on which the members of the circle sit should be wood or cane bottomed. The use of upholstered chairs is generally inadvisable. The table round which the members of the circle sit should be free from metal. The chair on which the medium sits must be cane or wood and, as already said, free from all cushions or upholstery. Atmospheric Conditions Atmospheric changes play a great and important part in all mediumistic conditions. The drier the atmosphere, the better the phenomena as a rule. On damp, rainy days, little can be obtained. During a thunderstorm, startling phenomena occasionally take place. High, rarefied air is better than that of lower levels and for that reason a house on the side or even the top of a high mountain should be selected, if possible, in which to hold seances. Failing this, select a house which has as high an altitude as possible. 
one member of the circle must by universal consent undertake to conduct the proceedings to converse with the spirits when they appear to arrange the sitters in their proper places to adjust the amount of light required etc his word must be followed at once and without question otherwise the necessary harmony will be destroyed and the circle will fail to obtain as good results excitement in all its forms should be avoided if one in the circle develop mediumistic power he should be placed next to a more fully developed medium unless instructions are given not to do so in this way the power is concentrated and focused at one point misuse of spirit advice never attempt to use psychic power for worldly purposes if you do you will invite mischievous and lying intelligences to your circle and the medium will possibly lose what mediumship he already possesses do not sit too frequently every other night at most should sittings be held or even twice a week see that the room is not too cool and is not unduly heated as soon as the first manifestations have been received encourage the spirits by talking to them in a natural tone or voice as you would if they were visibly present in the room speak to them as you would if they had returned to earth in bodily form be natural in fact you will get the best results this way many of those who are interested in spiritualism are so situated that they cannot join circles but wish to develop alone this is as a rule unwise unless someone is present who understands the phenomena which are likely to develop and who can help and give good advice when required you may do so if the following instructions are kept carefully in mind if you can provide yourself with a cabinet it would be very advisable to do so sit inside the cabinet on a comfortable chair and relax yourself thoroughly note whatever impressions come to you pay particular attention to your bodily feelings no less than your mental states do not exaggerate here or let your imagination have too free play if your legs should happen to tingle or the chair to creak do not put these down to spiritual influence they may be due to perfectly normal causes symptoms of oncoming mediumship for the first few evenings you will possibly notice nothing much of interest although very psychic persons begin to develop almost at once a peculiar lightness and buzzing is sometimes experienced in the head together with a sense of numbness in the hands and arms and sometimes in the feet and legs the respiration seems to become slower and so does the heart tiny lights and spots and light or dark spots appear in the air at a distance of one to two feet in front of the subject a peculiar pressure is sometimes experienced on the top of the head or on the base of the brain or in the solar plexus swishing sounds as of the sea breaking upon the seashore may be heard and a sensation that something inside the head is going round and round in spirals the head the hands and sometimes the whole body break out into a profuse perspiration at this point these are the first sensations of oncoming mediumship very often they are not pleasant for the first few weeks but if this period be passed the unpleasant sensations will as a rule vanish and the subject will then develop true mediumship of one character or another getting the best results just here it is advisable to state that the would-be medium should not at first sit for the express purpose of cultivating any particular phase of mediumship he may desire to obtain materialization but unless he is naturally endowed in this matter he might sit forever and obtain nothing whereas if he developed whatever phenomena presented themselves he might very soon develop into a striking medium in some other line to return however to the early development of mediumship soon after these early impressions have been noticed the subject may note for the first time that his mind is peculiarly susceptible to influences of all kinds he feels as if his mind has been skinned so to speak and that he is now exposed to the psychic breezes from every direction he may become erratic and irritable and develop moods 
which he himself cannot understand. Peculiar buzzings in the head are, are sometimes heard. Sometimes cloud-like masses seem to form in space before him, twisting and turning and moving up and down and round about in very irregular motion. As a rule, these clouds appear to be of the consistency of vapor, though they may in time become more and more solid until they become built up into definite forms. Of this, however, later. Early Signs and Experiences At this phase of the development, the subject may feel cool breezes blowing upon his hands and face from various directions, breezes which appear to be perfectly physical in character. He may also experience a peculiar sticky sensation on his hands and face, as though cobwebs were applied over the bare skin which is exposed. This cobwebby sensation is very common, and is not limited, as many think, to mediums who obtain materialization. Colors and Voices In the early stage of the development, mediums very often see colors of various shades and hues in space before them. They are unable to tell whether or not these colors have any definite shape or outline. They seem to possess an odd, irregular shape of their own, something like a large blot of ink. At this stage, also, many psychics see faces of friends and relatives, either living or dead, just as they are falling asleep or as they are awakening in the morning, usually the former. They also see many strange faces. These may be mere vague images, or clearly outlined, Instead of the faces, they may hear voices speaking. And the first thing which these voices generally say is the name of the subject himself. After this, the voices may become more and more clear and intense. But such phenomena should be permitted only at stated times. Because if they are allowed to develop whenever they may be experienced, trouble may result. Many odd and grotesque figures and shapes may present themselves to the mind's eye at this stage of development. These shapes may be highly colored, or may be almost colorless, seeming to be made of the air itself, yet somehow separated from this in outline. Many of these images are symbolic, though as a rule, a few of them are recognizable. More often, they represent curious patterns and figures, such as roses, circles, outlines of patterns, such as may be seen on the wallpaper, and occasionally weird and horrible images flash into the mind, to be gone again in the next instant. Unpleasant Experiences If these manifestations develop an unpleasant character at the time, they should be checked instantly. The subject may do this in several ways. First of all, he should build up his physical health. Second, he should See to it that he obtains plenty of sleep. Third, he should exercise his brain as little as possible on anything of this unpleasant character. Fourth, he should keep busily occupied in material, practical things, and leave himself no time to ponder and dwell upon these unpleasant experiences. Fifth, he should avoid, by all means, daydreaming and never allow his mind to become passive or absent-minded. He should cultivate his objective attention and interest, in short, and focus his whole personality, as it were, between his eyes, so as to have it under thorough control. If he does this, and refuses to sit for development for a short time, he will find that these early unpleasant symptoms, should they develop, will soon wear off. And this advice holds good for any stage in the development of mediumship. Exaggeration and Imagination Many of those who develop psychic phenomena are inclined to exaggerate the importance of the manifestations they receive during the early stages of their mediumship. Everything seems so new and strange to them, so remarkable, so unaccountable, so beyond the experience of the average person, that they feel bound to tell it to everyone they meet and usually it loses nothing in the telling. They fail to realize that every medium who has been developed has gone through these same early stages, but has progressed beyond them years before. In observing these phenomena in yourself, you must be very careful to distinguish between the facts which really occur 
and the fantasies of your own excited imagination, which is inclined to extend and amplify these facts beyond all recognition. Thus, suppose a, a blurred outline of a face presents itself to you. The next day you meet your cousin on the street. You instantly come to the conclusion that the face you saw was that of your cousin, while, as a matter of fact, it might not have borne the least resemblance to him. This is a very simple case, but will serve to explain the point in question. Why and how your power may be lost. If you obtain such phenomena, you must be very careful not to exaggerate them, for if you do, you will quite possibly lose the real sensitiveness that you are beginning to acquire, and this will be replaced by the products of an overexcited imagination. This is a truth well known, as you may see by the following quotation, from a work which appeared in 1813 entitled Animal Magnetism by Deleuze. For in it he says, quote, Do not press the sonambulist too much, for if you do, you will gain nothing. You will even lose the advantages which you might derive from his lucidity. It is possible that you could make him speak upon all the subjects of your personal curiosity, but in that case you will make him leave his own sphere and introduce him in yours. He will no longer have any other resources than yourself. He will utter to you very eloquent discourses, but they will be no more dictated by the external inspirations. They will be the product of his recollections or of his imagination. Perhaps you will also rouse his vanity, and then all is lost. He will not re-enter the circle from which he has wandered. The two states cannot be confounded." End quote. The student who cultivates mediumship should, therefore, be careful to preserve a clear head and a modest estimate of his own phenomena. If he does, he will doubtless progress rapidly and favorably. End of chapter 1. Recording by Michael Packard. Chapter 2 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 2. Harmonious Conditions If we exert ourselves in any way whatever, we desire certain conditions in order to bring our powers and faculties into play to the best advantage. If we are undertaking to perform any feat of physical strength, of intellectual or spiritual achievement, we desire to be free from care and worry, distraction and irritation, to be enabled to center and focus the whole of our energy in the channel desired. It is the same with mediumship. Conditions for the Exercise of Psychic Powers Professor Flurney of Geneva writes in this connection, quote, As to the influence of various physical and mental conditions upon the exercise of mediumship, my correspondents are unanimous in condemning as absolute hindrances, or at least grave obstacles, to the production of phenomena, all such causes as physical exhaustion, disturbing emotions, uneasiness, absorbing thoughts, fatigue, enervation, etc. The conditions required for the successful exercise of mediumistic powers are the same as for the voluntary exercise of any other power. A state of good health, nervous equilibrium, calm, the absence of care, good humor, sympathetic surroundings, etc. Many insist upon moral elevation, purity of conduct, noble aspirations, altruism, etc., saying that these things strengthen mediumship, while the lower sentiments, such as cupidity, pride, jealousy, etc., are the cause of much loss of power. Others have insisted that certain physical conditions have a propitious effect, silence, semi-obscurity, good ventilation, fasting, etc. End quote. Necessity for Conditions Those who do not understand the laws of spiritualism have contended that the conditions demanded by mediums are often absurd, for the reason that they permit trickery. If the conditions permit the practice of fraud, they should not be allowed. Beyond this, 
any conditions required by the medium should be granted, for the medium alone is the one to know what these conditions should be. Mediumship, doubtless, has its conditions, its own psychic laws, just as any other exercise of the inner powers. Many skeptics do not see this. They say, if you can produce these phenomena, you must be able to produce them at any time, just as we can always produce the same effects in a chemical or physical laboratory. Why all this fuss about conditions, etc.? But they fail to take into consideration human nature, and the fact that psychic laws and physical laws are different. We can easily prove this. Conditions in Art Take any musical composer, or any artist who paints, and seat him at a table with instructions to compose a sonata or paint a wonderful picture within half an hour. Suppose that during all the time the work is in progress, noise and flurry is constantly going on in the same room. The desk at which the artist works is being shaken. Children are continually running in and out of the room, etc. Do you think that, under such conditions, a masterpiece in either music or art could be produced? Could a poet compose a sonnet under such conditions? Certainly he could not. The exercise of mediumistic power is assuredly as delicate, as subtle, as refined, as easily disturbed, as any of these productions of the genius of man. How absurd, therefore, to pretend or contend that mediums should be able to exercise their powers whenever they want them, under any conditions, and to contend further that if they fail to do so they are therefore frauds and humbugs. For the successful exercise of mediumship or psychic power in any direction, the essentials which have been mentioned above must be fulfilled, as well as any others which the medium may feel are required. These must by all means be granted, for if they are not, it is highly probable that no phenomena at all will be obtained. Harmony All Important Harmony is the keynote of successful mediumship, harmony of physical, mental, and spiritual life. This is only carrying to its logical conclusion what we observe every day all around us. Have we not all felt, immediately upon meeting certain persons, that they were attractive or repellent to us? We felt either drawn or repulsed inwardly, for no reason that we could define. Many theories have been advanced to explain this fact, but the most probable is that, surrounding each individual, there is an aura or psychic atmosphere which surrounds him like a halo or sheath, extending some distance outward from the body, and varying with the individual temperament, emotions, and the physical and mental health. If these auras are sympathetic, if they blend one with another, then we have attraction, leading in many cases to love at first sight. If the opposite conditions exist, we have instinctive dislikes, which are generally correct. As the poet said, I do not like you, Dr. Fell. The reason why, I cannot tell. Mental Harmony Next to physical harmony comes mental harmony, and here is a wide field for observation and experiment. All spiritualists know that persons of certain temperaments must be excluded from serious circles, if the better class of phenomena are to be obtained. Such persons include the flippant, the arrogant, the unduly skeptical, the frivolous, etc. In addition to this, however, finer and more subtle points of mental harmony must be adjusted in our mental scales. It is advisable, whenever possible, to bring together persons having more or less the same point of view, interests, and sympathies. Sympathetic people always obtain better phenomena than the extremely intellectual ones. In the latter, the mind is, so to speak, hard, unyielding, and tends to build up a wall or barrier between itself and the medium, which it is difficult or even impossible for the latter to break through. We have known of several cases in which mediums were unable to obtain any results at all for individuals of the very intellectual and, so to speak, critical type of mind, whereas they could obtain an abundance of striking manifestations for the sympathetic and more congenial natures. Excessive Gravity At the same time, extreme gravity and seriousness on all occasions is to be avoided. Every person who investigates spiritualism should see to it that he preserves throughout his sense of humor, and his continued contact with, and interest in, the things of this world. If he does not do this, he is liable to become unduly swayed and overbalanced by the messages which are given to him, 
and by the startling and at first sight almost appalling fact that communication with the spirits of the departed has really been established if he does not preserve his balance and common sense at such times he is liable to become not only unduly credulous but even to fly off the handle altogether and his mind may in some instances actually become unhinged be careful therefore to keep the compartments of your mind water-tight as it were and not allow your interest for the things spiritual to overflow and swamp your interest in things material spiritual harmony next we come to spiritual sympathy and harmony which is perhaps most important of all in the formation of successful circles this would include an interest in spiritual things aspirations benevolence sympathy a more or less religious turn of mind tolerance and the ability to see things from the standpoint of another this being sympathy in its broadest sense it is the blending together of a number of temperaments of this character which constitutes the successful circle the reason for this harmony and delicate adjustment of conditions may be seen readily enough by a reference to the phenomena not only of the mental but of the physical world for instance if you set into vibration a tuning fork this will emit a note of a certain pitch another tuning fork distant many feet from the first will instantly vibrate in unison if the two are attuned one to the other but unless the tuning forks are adjusted at precisely the right pitch they will not respond and a thousand tuning forks may be placed around the room but none of them will respond in any way to the vibration of the first this crude analogy drawn from the physical world will show us how essential harmony is and if this be true in material phenomena more certainly is it true in the mental and spiritual realms harmony and vibration every individual is said to vibrate at a certain rate this is his own pitch so to say and no two human beings are alike this definite rate of vibration doubtless corresponds to the personality of the individual and though no two can be absolutely alike those who approximate each other the nearest would be the most sympathetic and would be the most drawn one to the other and if this is true of spirits incarnate here in this life it is doubtless true when applied to the relations between our own spirits and the spirits of those who have passed over there is an old saying that like attracts like if the tone of the circle and of the individuals composing it is high the aspirations elevated and pure that circle will attract to it spirits from the other side having the same vibrations as itself the circle will in fact only come in contact with good and not evil spirits certainly there are exceptions to every rule but the above is the general law which may be stated in broad terms as true for were this not the case we might contend that no such thing as justice existed in the universe and that chance and not moral law held all in its sway but we know that this is not the case inasmuch as we feel assured in our heart of hearts that beauty truth and justice are the foundation stones upon which this universe is built we might rightly suppose that this is in every case the truth and that a circle formed by serious-minded investigators having in view only the highest and best motives would draw to them helpful and loving spirits from the great beyond and the history of spiritualism proves this to be the fact how to fit yourself for a circle the method you should follow to fit yourself most effectually for becoming a member of one of these advanced circles is as follows you should perfect and make as wholesome as possible the physical body in which you live this is brought about by paying particular attention to the diet and by taking an abundance of exercise deep breathing and frequent baths many spiritualists have become vegetarians with this object in view and also non-smokers and abstainers from alcohol tea and coffee are also debarred in some quarters but such strict measures are usually advised only for those who are striving for individual spiritual perfection and need not necessarily be followed by one who is a member of a large circle of course such measures cannot fail to benefit an individual in any case the keystone of the arch cultivate cheerfulness altruism and a simple wholesome point of view banishing fear as you would the devil and never allowing it for a moment to dominate or enter into you preserve a sane religious balance and endeavor in any way possible to cultivate sympathy for the point of view of others 
no matter how prejudiced and narrow it may be. Keep your mind lifted up, elevated, and, as Andrew Jackson Davis said, under all circumstances, keep an even mind. If you do not naturally possess it, cultivate an insight into things spiritual, and above all, true benevolence and sympathy. This is the keystone of the arch erected to, and supporting, self-perfection. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 3 Fear and How to Banish It we are our own greatest enemies we create the majority of the ills from which we suffer in psychic investigation more people have suffered from fear than from any other depressing emotion but in nine cases out of ten these fears have been perfectly groundless and the subject has had all his fears and worry for nothing he has crossed his bridges before coming to them were he to reflect for a moment he would find that the terrible things he feared very rarely came to him that the majority of the experiences which he actually went through were of such a nature that he needn't have feared them at all fear wrecks faith saves fear is not only useless for the reason that it prevents nothing but it is actually harmful from this double standpoint in the first place it helps to induce the condition we are fearing as job said that which i greatly feared has come upon me he thought about and dreaded certain conditions so much that he doubtless created them while had he not done so they would never have come upon him professor william james gives us a very good illustration of the way in which fear sometimes brings about its own fulfillment he says suppose that for example i am climbing in the alps and have the ill luck to work myself into a position from which the only escape is by a terrible leap being without similar experience i have no evidence of my ability to perform it successfully but hope and confidence in myself make me sure that i shall not miss my aim and nerve my feet to execute what without those subjective emotions would perhaps have been impossible but suppose that on the contrary the emotions of fear and mistrust predominate or suppose that i feel that it would be sinful to act upon an assumption unverified by previous experience why then i shall hesitate so long that at last exhausted and trembling and launching myself in a moment of despair i miss my foothold and roll into the abyss in this case and this is one of an immense class the part of wisdom clearly is to believe what one desires for the belief is one of the indispensable preliminary conditions for the realization of its object there are then cases where faith creates its own verification believe and you shall be right for you shall save yourself doubt and you shall again be right for you shall perish the only difference is that to believe is greatly to your advantage the obvious lesson to be drawn from this is that you should not fear the unknown or unseen until you have had just cause to do so if you do it will predispose you to experience the very manifestations you most dread evil effects of fears upon the body in the second place fear has a destructive and depressing effect upon the body it depletes the vitality lowers the respiration and doubly incapacitates you from performing any serious rational work or carrying on any rational common-sense train of thought fear therefore is certainly to be avoided for it helps nobody and harms everybody but the reader may object i cannot control my fear so easily it is a thing beyond my power i do not pursue fear it pursues and overtakes me to a certain extent this may be true there are two kinds of fear the unreasoning instinctive fear and the conscious reflective fear 
the former is a relic of our lowly ancestry and is shared by all the higher animals we cannot help that but such fear as a rule is only momentary and is over in a few instants we have the impulse to flee etc which demands immediate expression but this instinctive fear may be overcome by the mind our reason tells us upon second thought that we have no cause to fear and we stop abashed and ashamed of ourselves this is not the fear which we have to correct as a rule since it is bodily rather than mental and of short duration the kind of fear to fear the conscious mental fear is that which bothers us and which we should learn to cure we are sufficiently advanced in civilization and in the understanding of things spiritual to know that all is natural nothing is supernatural even if a spirit returns to us that is a natural event though it may not be a common or ordinary event and for this reason we call it supernormal but why should we be afraid of the spirit of a dearly beloved friend or relative or even the spirit of a stranger coming to us in this way any more than we should be afraid of it when coming to us in the flesh it is the same spirit in one case possessing a physical body in the other case animating only an ethereal body of what is there to be afraid spirits are but human beings such as ourselves we are spirits here and now just as much as we ever will be spirits are in fact human beings who have passed through a certain experience called death and as professor mino savage says they are just folks why therefore should we be afraid of them the powers of darkness we must school the mind to reflection and by due exercise of the reason and the will not to be afraid of such happenings but rather to accept them and be thankful for them and to treat them either as scientific happenings or as spiritual events of great significance and help in either case there is truly no cause to fear it is true that in the case of many persons darkness brings with it a peculiar sense of dread which is experienced by nearly all children and which is to a certain extent shared by many animals a dog will go to the door of a dark room peer in and slink away even insects often refuse to go into dark places the cat alone seems to enjoy the uncanny sensation which accompanies darkness and we know that cats are proverbial ghost lovers while dogs are the reverse it may be that there is more truth in this belief than many realize we know that the orthodox devil was known as the king of the powers of darkness and all evil things are associated with that state on the other hand jesus was said to be the light of the world and light always accompanied spiritual manifestations as it does today the expression made use of by mr hamlin garland some years ago in his book the tyranny of the dark may therefore have a certain foundation there are perhaps principalities and powers which can operate more freely and fully in the dark than in the light but only if they are allowed to do so by the fear and the attitude and mind of the person experiencing them we remember that in pilgrim's progress the travellers were repeatedly warned that no harm could come to them so long as they faced their spiritual enemies and we must remember the words of the greatest of all psychics resist the devil and he will flee from thee all we have to do therefore in order to prevent the domination of any evil thought or power is to fight it resist it meet it strongly and courageously with calmness and decision and it will melt before your attack like dew before the rays of the morning sun evil emotions mr horace fletcher in his little book on happiness says some very good things regarding fear which he defines as an expression of fear thought fear thought according to this author is the self-imposed or self-permitted suggestion of inferiority it is both a cause and an effect of selfishness it is the taproot of evil the body is a mirror in which all states of the soul are reflected 
perhaps the most extensive of all the morbid mental conditions which reflect themselves so disastrously on the human system is the state of fear dr hack took in his book the influence of the mind upon the body cites a number of well-authenticated instances of disease having been produced by fear or fright insanity idiocy paralysis of various muscles and organs profuse perspiration turning the hair gray in a short time baldness nervous shock followed by fatal anemia malformation of the embryo and even skin and other diseases apparently more removed than these from the effects of the mind were traced to the effects of fear and other mental disturbances he pointed out also that epidemics such as cholera smallpox diphtheria and other malignant diseases obtain a footing in a community largely through the fear of the inhabitants and that hundreds and even thousands of persons fall victims to their own mental conditions how fear causes sickness how does fear operate upon the body to produce sickness largely by paralyzing the nerve centers especially those of the vasomotor nerves thus producing not only muscular relaxation but capillary congestions of all kinds it is an interesting fact that fear and all depressing emotions of a similar nature serve to constrict or contract the body while mirth love altruism and all the higher emotions serve to produce both physical and mental relaxation opening up the mental and physiological doorways of the organism the term frightened to death is not a mere expression but is founded upon valid physiological and psychological laws a southern physician has reported an interesting case it was that of a big burly negro who supposed that he had been fatally shot fear had seized him with tremendous power he shook like an aspen leaf he bordered on the state of collapse and death seemed imminent not finding any blood the examining physician ordered all his clothes removed and while he was being undressed a flattened bullet fell upon the floor the doctor exhibited the bullet to the frightened patient explaining that he had had a miraculous escape whereupon his circulation was immediately restored his countenance improved his temperature became normal and the look of life returned to his eyes which had been fixed with the gaze of death while a broad grin crept over his face the negro got down from the operating table and dressed apologized for the fuss he had caused and walked home fear is contagious fear has the peculiar power of being extremely contagious under the proper conditions fear manifested by one person is instantly communicated to the entire company they feel little chills run up and down their spines their hair begins to stand on end and a cold perspiration breaks out here and there over the body this shows the profound effect which this emotion has upon the bodily functions and also how easily it may be acquired without reason fear has the power of almost stopping the heart and paralyzing the entire nervous system a peculiar fatigue is also caused by fear as has been proved by delicate experiments a natural and normal way to overcome fear under such conditions is to open the mind to natural faith and normal trust let the psychic forces be allied with faith and health let fear be finally and forever cast down and banished from the mental domain this may often be brought about by reasoning though an effort of will is generally necessary also a determined opposition accompanied by trust faith in wise protection faith in your own powers and in the help of friendly spiritual monitors are of the greatest use and benefit in overcoming this great monster fear the fear of evil spirits many people are afraid of evil spirits being alarmed lest they should influence them against their will and cause them to do certain things which they would not normally care to do even to the point of obsessing them there is a real danger here to a certain extent which will be dwelt upon and explained in the chapter on obsession 
but let it be pointed out that the only way to prevent such things is to keep up a normal healthful resistant attitude of mind and not to give way to fear which would be doing the very thing to invite attack let us recall once more the words of job in this connection so long as the sea walls or dikes of holland are sound and unimpaired the ocean is kept within its proper limits and cannot break through and flood the land as it sometimes does when these walls are destroyed as we know a tiny little hole through which the merest trickle of water can pass will unless repaired soon become a wide crevice and then a roaring torrent the most important thing to do is to check this in its inception for it is easy to prevent the ingress of the water if taken in time better still it would be far easier to keep the sea walls in such repair that accidents of this kind would be impossible for prevention is better than cure applying this to the case before us we can see that the very first symptoms of fear must be checked as soon as they arise for if they are allowed to continue they will spread and work havoc in the mind just as the waters would work havoc upon the land the thing to do is to keep the mind so guarded strengthened and repaired by healthful exercise intelligent cultivation and control in the exercise of the will that fear can never batter down its ramparts and even should it attack the citadel of the mind it would be quite unable to find a lodgment within this impregnable fortress the fear of being hypnotized what has been said applies also to the action of hypnotic influences which many persons fear greatly they are afraid of being hypnotized by some distant operator and this fear sometimes becomes with them a veritable phobia so that we occasionally find insane asylum patients who have become completely unhinged on account of this fear we can see from this how useless how exceedingly harmful fear of this character is and it is more than useless it is ridiculous no one can be hypnotized against his own will by a distant operator in this way as many suppose if they feel influences of this character these feelings are the result of their own disordered imagination and are not due to any outside influence whatever an individual really hypnotizes himself the operator directing his own mental powers into certain channels so that this is brought about if he resists the suggestion as every one can do at first it is impossible for any one to hypnotize him why such fears are groundless the only way in which a person can be hypnotized from a distance is the following if an operator has hypnotized his subject a great many times and repeatedly suggested to him when in the hypnotic trance that he is becoming more suggestible that he can easily go off to sleep that he has only to think of the operator in order to fall asleep etc he may succeed in making the subject so sensitive after a certain length of time that this condition is really brought about the subject tends to fall into trance on the slightest provocation but such cases are abnormal and are rarely met with and as i have just said this condition cannot be brought about until the subject has been hypnotized several times in these suggestions given to him these are well-known facts which any experienced hypnotist will sustain this being so it may readily be seen how absurd it is to fear telepathic suggestion from a distant operator whom perhaps you have never seen it is entirely illusory and you need in reality have no fear whatever in this connection the will if exercised is supreme end of chapter three fear and how to banish it recording by pamela Krantz. chapter four of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington Chapter 4. The Subconscious In this chapter, I shall take up and try to make plain to the student the nature and functions of the subconscious mind. 
this is the greatest of all stumbling blocks to many spiritualists its possibilities and at the same time its limitations should be made clear to the student at the beginning of his studies otherwise he is sure to get in trouble later on not only with himself and with the phenomena he is studying but with all persons who discuss these subjects with him and try to persuade him that the whole of spiritualism may be accounted for by the powers of the subconscious what is the subconscious mind first of all what is the subconscious mind we do not know exactly but a great deal has been found out concerning it within the past quarter of a century twenty years ago when thompson j hudson wrote his famous work the law of psychic phenomena very little was known of the subconscious nearly everything which has been discovered about it has been learned since he wrote his attitude is doubtless well known to the majority of my readers it is that man has two minds the conscious and the subconscious or as he preferred to express it the objective and the subjective minds the first of these is the conscious mind the everyday reasoning mind the second is that vast realm in which occur the phenomena of dreams hypnotism insanity hysteria clairvoyance telepathy and all kindred psychic phenomena he placed the objective mind in the cerebrum or fore part of the brain and the subjective mind in the cerebellum or hinder part of the brain two minds or one but this dual conception of the mind is today given up by practically all psychologists they admit that the mind is in a certain sense dual but it is believed that both minds are in reality one a part of which is conscious and of the greater part of which we know nothing the analogy of the iceberg has often been used a small percentage of this emerges above the water and this we see and know but the greater part of the mountain of ice is below the surface and this we do not know through our senses yet it is all one iceberg in the same way there is only one mind but when the searchlight of consciousness is turned upon certain areas those areas become illuminated and we know or are conscious of those parts all else remains in the dim obscurity beyond in the great storehouse of the subconscious mind the powers of the subconscious it may easily be proved that the subconscious mind acquires far more information even through the senses than does the conscious mind the following simple experiment will prove this lead a person into a strange room and ask him to observe as many things in it as he possibly can suppose he remains five seconds in that room he is then quickly removed and the door shut if now he is asked to tell you all the things that he remembers having seen he will probably be enabled to remember ten or fifteen of them but if you were to hypnotize that person he would then describe to you under hypnotic influence forty or fifty things which were in the room this shows us that the subconscious mind which we reached through hypnotism has been able to perceive or take in many more things than the conscious mind this happens to us every day dreams it is the same with dreams if when out walking we should happen to drop a brooch pin or a piece of money we might be totally unconscious of the fact but the subconscious mind would perceive and record it that night in sleep we might have a dream in which a figure appeared to us and told us that the article had been lost and that it would be found in such and such a place on looking the next morning sure enough there it was here we see that the subconscious has perceived a certain fact which the conscious mind did not notice for long it was thought that this power signified some supernormal faculty of the subconscious mind but in most cases it is not necessary to suppose this for as the last experiment showed us the subconscious mind takes in many things which the conscious mind does not and only the most striking and interesting facts rise into consciousness of the thousands of events going on all around us every day we perceive but a few all the rest are ignored though they are lodged within the great mental storehouse within us the memory of the subconscious the powers of the subconscious mind are indeed great it forgets nothing and facts which have entirely slipped from the conscious mind are retained within it and may be recalled years later or may suddenly flash into the memory of their own accord they may come into the mind in the form of some simple thought or memory just as any other thought or memory would or they may come to us in more startling form they may be as we say externalized that is 
projected upward from the subconscious into the conscious mind forcibly and dramatically as a bombshell might be exploded within it in these cases the thought may strike us as coming wholly from without and not from within ourselves at all one or two examples will make this clear you have mislaid a book you cannot remember where it is the natural process would be to recollect in the case of an individual who is psychic or mediumistic the externalization may take more startling form he may hear a voice telling him to look under certain papers upon the library table and sure enough upon looking there the book is found or he may have a mental picture of himself leaving the book in that place or he may feel a hand gently pushing him in the direction of the table or he may see a figure standing before him and pointing to the hidden book in all these cases it is improbable that the voice the touch and the figure were real that is that they came from some spirit friend they may have done so but it is true that in many cases at least they are methods by which the subconscious mind externalizes or reproduces its hidden memories in dramatic form just as they are reproduced in dreams or in visions of the crystal ball the psychic diaphragm the subconscious mind therefore may be looked upon as composed of a number of strata like a layer cake which are normally more or less separated from one another by a sort of a psychic membrane or diaphragm which is impervious at times this psychic diaphragm becomes thinned in that case we remember our dreams of the previous night or we have wonderful constructions of genius the productions of musical prodigies etc the subconscious mind works out the problems and the finished product is projected into the conscious mind in its completed form that is why it appears to us so marvelous on the other hand if a part of the subconscious mind is diseased as may sometimes happen then we have hysteria obsession and insanity it will be seen therefore that both good and evil may result from this thinning or puncturing of the psychic diaphragm separating the conscious from the subconscious mind if the mind be healthy and is kept so only good will result psychic powers will be cultivated and helpful advice will be given to the subject thenceforward if on the other hand the mind becomes in any way deranged or diseased then harm may result and the individual may be sorry that he has ruptured this dividing diaphragm instead of preserving it intact it is all a question of care good health good judgment and a healthy psychic mental and physical life once this psychic membrane has been so to say punctured it is very difficult to heal it up again and great care must be exercised in developing these subconscious phenomena we shall discuss this more fully however in the chapter devoted to obsession the subconscious mind should be made our friend and not our enemy we should train it carefully for though it is a good servant it is a bad master it should always be kept in check and dominated and controlled by the conscious mind when this is the case all goes well how the subconscious reckons time the subconscious has among other faculties the power of reckoning time in a most remarkable manner many of my readers have doubtless conducted the following experiment for themselves on going to bed you have said to yourself now i wish to wake tomorrow morning at seven o'clock promptly because i have such and such a train to catch there is no alarm clock in the house but promptly at seven you awake that this is no mere chance coincidence has been proven by a number of cases which have been collected and the fact has also been proven experimentally on hypnotic subjects thus they have been told that in say nine thousand seven hundred fifty seconds they would perform a certain action then they were immediately awakened as soon as awake they knew nothing of the suggestion which had been given to them and nothing of the action they were to perform and yet precisely in nine thousand seven hundred fifty seconds they performed the action in question we see therefore that the subconscious mind has the faculty of reckoning time in a very remarkable manner and this is but one of its mysterious powers the subconscious rules the body another of its remarkable manifestations is the power which it possesses over the bodily organization by means of suggestion the pulse has been raised or slowed the temperature has been elevated or lowered the various secretions of the body have been altered and many similar phenomena which are well known to anyone who has read upon this subject one of the most striking cases doubtless is that of mademoiselle ilma x a pair of cold scissors was applied to her chest 
and it was suggested that these were red hot and that they were burning the flesh in a few moments an angry red mark appeared corresponding to the shape of the scissors and the next day a genuine blister had been created which took several days to heal here we see the power of the subconscious mind in affecting the body and even the local tissues to a remarkable extent if this is true and the body can be harmed in this way it can doubtless also be cured we here enter the field of suggestion and psychotherapy which will be treated more fully in chapter thirty how to give your own subconscious mind suggestions one of the best methods of treating yourself is by suggesting certain desirable things just as you are falling off to sleep thus if anything is wrong with you physically mentally or spiritually suggest to yourself the last thing at night as you are falling to sleep that all will be well that the trouble will be removed during the night that you will wake up refreshed and invigorated that there be no pain no unpleasant feelings or emotions in the morning etc suggest in fact whatever you desire to have accomplished and you will find that during the night this will have been effected and that your bodily or mental ills will have disappeared as the result of your auto suggestion during the hours of sleep here again we shall be enabled to see the remarkable powers of the subconscious mind brought into play and clearly demonstrated spirit messages and the subconscious now these faculties of the subconscious mind explain a certain number of spirit messages which are received at seances let me illustrate this in the following manner just before leaving your home to join a circle you glance at the evening paper your attention has been attracted to the leading articles apparently you have seen nothing else at the seance that evening the name of a friend of yours is spelled out and the announcement that this friend has been killed that day by falling from the fourth story of his residence at first sight this seems a very good test message but on going home and again looking at your evening paper you find a small article tucked away in the corner of the paper stating these facts therefore probably what happened was this your subconscious mind perceived and took in these facts without their even rising to consciousness and at the seance they were given out either by yourself or by the medium who obtained them from your mind by telepathy in this way many messages have been explained and shown to be due to the workings of the subconscious mind and not to spirits at all we must therefore always be on our guard against these possibilities the structure of the mind the older conception of the human mind was that it was a single entity an individual thing a sort of sphere incapable of division this was in fact one of plato's main arguments for the immortality of the soul unfortunately modern science has destroyed this illusion we now know that the human mind is a composite and not a simple thing to use a rough analogy it has been proved that the mind is somewhat like a rope composed of a number of strands twisted together under normal healthy conditions this rope remains one the strands are united but under certain abnormal states or conditions these strands may be divided up into several groups and they would all pull in different directions what holds these strands together normally first good health then cheerfulness attention concentration will and an interest in objective things what favors this disintegration process this dissociation of the mind as it is called the exact opposite of all this a run-down or fatigued condition introspection and particularly all continued subjective practices and the too passive attitude of the mind if we lose contact with and interest in the objective world if we go inside our hands and spin romances and dream daydreams to too great an extent if we gaze blankly into space thinking of nothing in particular if we allow the mind to become too passive and do not exercise our intellect in a normal healthy manner this disintegration is likely to take place the strands of the rope become separated and then the mind may go to pieces and spirit obsession and even insanity may result how to heal a sick mind of course this is only a crude analogy the mind is not like a rope and cannot be divided into strands in the same way but it is an analogy which will help us the only way to heal and restore a mind in this condition is to weave or weld together these separate strands and bind them up again into one solid single rope as it were this may often be done by hypnotism but great care must be exercised in doing this for if it is not rightly applied by an expert operator the mind may become still more disintegrated and 
the last state of that man shall be worse than the first. Now, these separate strands of the mind, to return to our analogy of the rope, may form different selves. Each self may possess a certain identity and individuality of its own, and they may all pull in different directions. That is, they may all exercise their own functions and powers, and think their own thoughts. There is no one self any more. It has gone to pieces. These various selves may alternate one with another in the same individual, and then we have those interesting cases known to us as alternating personality. If there are two of these, we have double personality. If there are three or more of these personalities, we have a case of multiple personality. There are sometimes six or seven of these, and in one case, it was reported that there were ten, all in the same individual, all alternating with one another, all having their own prejudices, likes, dislikes, interests, points of view, and knowledge of persons and things. Many such cases have been cured by welding together several of these selves by hypnotic suggestion, when the original man was restored. The Differences Between Spirits and Subconscious Selves Now, if this be true, and it has been proved to be true by many well-authenticated cases, how distinguish these selves from true spirits? This is a very complex question which cannot be fully answered in this place, because we must understand, first of all, more of the nature of the subconscious mind and its powers. But one simple test can be applied, which is this. All these personalities, or parts of selves, derive their knowledge of men and things through the same source, namely the five senses. None of them can possibly know any fact which was not supplied to them through sight, hearing, touch, etc., so that if any of them manifest supernormal knowledge, this proves to us at once either that some external intelligence is present, or that this personality, whatever it may be, has acquired this knowledge in some occult manner, by telepathy, clairvoyance, etc. Which of these two interpretations is the correct one, I shall endeavor to answer in another place. Personalities Created by Hypnotism It may seem incomprehensible to many how the human mind can become split up or dissociated in this manner. They think that this is rather a far-fetched theory, and prefer to believe the simple theory of spiritism, as applied even to the most simple facts. This might be admissible, but for the following consideration. We can trace a gradual series of intermediate steps, all the way from normal states of mind to these dissociations. In daydreaming and absent-mindedness, we see the first of these steps. When we hypnotize a subject, and suggest to him that he is Napoleon Bonaparte or Julius Caesar, and he enacts the part with due gravity, we can hardly suppose that Napoleon Bonaparte or Julius Caesar really returned to manifest through him. And should any be inclined to accept this view, it may be said that the hypnotic subject will just as easily carry out the suggestion that he is a lion or a bear or a bird flying in the air, and no one, we imagine, would contend that a lion or a bear or a bird really manifested at such times. So, therefore, we see that one part of the mind may enact a little comedy by itself, without the knowledge of another part, and from this simple fact, to the most striking phenomena of the subconscious, we can trace a definite chain of connection. THE PICTURE-FORMING FACULTY OF THE MIND One of the most striking powers which the subconscious mind possesses is its ability to reconstruct mental pictures or photographs of distant or imaginary persons. Your mind contains a whole picture gallery of all your friends, which you see, as it were, in your mind's eye. This is limited not only to your friends and relatives, but to heroes of books you have read, and even to imaginary personages. These pictures are not set and inert, but live and move, and we place the characters in various situations and cause them to move, act, and talk as human beings would do. Thus, suppose your friend A, or David Harum, or some imaginary personage, were thought by you to be on a journey. You would imagine them to be in various situations and would picture to yourself precisely how they would act in each situation, and would put into their mouths arguments and conversations which they would carry on with those about them. This faculty which the mind possesses is a very peculiar one, and its functions are technically known as spiritoid functions. They have a great bearing upon spiritism. How Dream Personalities Talk These phenomena show us how easy it is for the subconscious to imagine that various personages are present, carrying on a conversation with us, etc., whereas, as a matter of fact, they are not present at all, but were invented by us. 
if therefore at a seance some exalted personage appears and claims to communicate we must always assure ourselves first of all that this personage is not one of these semi-conscious or subconscious creations and must make him give proof of his own identity this faculty of the mind is again seen in dreams in dreams we create situations in a similar manner and imagine that other personages are present talking to us we have long debates and arguments with such personages and sometimes they beat us out so you see how important it is to be sure that the intelligences which communicate at seances are not creations but are really individualities as they claim to be how to distinguish true from false how are we to prove this and make this distinction you may say the following is the first method all our knowledge whether it is conscious or subconscious is supposed to be obtained through the five senses the subconscious is built upon the facts obtained by means of hearing sight touch etc now if the communicating intelligence tells us many facts as proof of its identity which the mind of the medium never knew we have fairly good proof of identity or at least that the knowledge given was obtained by some supernormal means but decisive proof is not yet obtained we know that there are other methods of obtaining supernormal information for instance telepathy clairvoyance etc adding these powers to the subconscious faculties of the medium we have often a difficult task to prove that the intelligence which communicates with us is really the personage it claims to be repeated questions must be asked absolute proof of identity must be insisted upon and in this way only can we be sure that we have passed beyond the limitations of the subconscious mind of the medium and that we are really obtaining messages direct from the spirit world why and how spirits prove their identity this proof of identity is really the great problem and the first point to solve let me make this plain suppose that a cousin of yours had disappeared twelve years ago one day you receive a call over the telephone and a voice says to you i am your cousin so and so i demand my share of your uncle's will naturally you would reply how do i know that you are so and so in daily life it would be an easy matter to prove this he could appear before you in his physical body and you could identify him more or less easily in most cases but suppose he were so placed that he could never see you personally in such a case how could he prove to you that he really was the person in question he would have to relate to you a number of personal and detailed incidents in his past life which he would be the only likely person to know or relate facts which only he and you knew or tell you things which you did not know but which you afterwards found out to be correct if you received a number of these replies you would be right in concluding that he really was the person at the other end of the line and this is the way in which spirits prove to us their identity until they do so we can never be sure that the teachings they give are correct if they succeed in proving their identity we may then accept their word as to the conditions of the next life and other matters since they were always truthful people in this life and we have no reason to suppose that they are other than truthful now how we obtain spirit messages through the subconscious the subconscious is the channel through which we obtain spirit messages in nearly all cases that is they come through or by means of the subconscious mind and it therefore assists the spirits to communicate the spirit can manipulate or act upon the subconscious while it cannot readily affect the conscious mind this we can see ourselves in the following way many of us have noticed that just as we are dropping off to sleep a forgotten memory has flashed into our mind it could not find its way to our conscious attention while the latter was busy with the day's activities but as soon as the conscious mind became passive then the subconscious had the power to send up this memory or message of warning it is the same in the case of spirits who communicate they are only enabled to do so when the conscious mind is in abeyance quieted or abstracted more or less completely as in a trance then the spirit is enabled to act upon the subconscious mind of the medium and through it to reach us still in the body the subconscious is therefore the true medium or vehicle for the manifestation of discarnate spirits and this will become more apparent when we come to consider the phenomena of trance which will be dealt with more fully in a later chapter end of chapter four Chapter 5 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Sheeler. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herward Carrington. Chapter 5. Orthodox Theology has always taught us that when we die, we pass into either one of two places, heaven or hell. The Catholic Church introduces a third intermediary state, purgatory, and when in this state, souls may be helped either by those who have passed over or by the prayers of the living. It will thus be seen that, in this respect at least, the Catholic Church approaches nearer than any other religion the doctrines of spiritualism. Information regarding the spirit world has come to us in various ways. Seers or clairvoyants have gone on spiritual excursions into the spiritual world and have told us, on coming back, what they have remembered of their clairvoyant visions. Moses, St. John Swedenborg, Andrew Jackson Davis, and others were seers of this type. On the other hand, we have the direct statements of spirits who have come back and related to us the precise conditions existing in the next world. From both these sources, spiritualists have succeeded in constructing a fairly complete representative picture of the next life and its various activities. I propose here to give a rapid and more or less dogmatic resume of these teachings without fully endorsing them myself, but merely asking the reader to form his own opinion concerning them. Parent Contradictions there are various contradictory teachings regarding the future state which have been given us from time to time in the past, and it has been held by many that because of these contradictions, none of them can be trusted. Consequently, none of the descriptions can be true. Thus, spirits who return through many French mediums declare that reincarnation is a fact while those who return through English and American mediums declare that it is not a fact, etc. How are we to account for these discrepancies? As this is a stumbling block to many spiritualists, the reason for these contradictions must be given at once. The answer is, as a matter of fact, simple enough. Spirits tell us that after death, they are by no means omniscient. On the contrary, they enter the next life as before said, carrying with them all their prejudices, beliefs, and preconceived opinions. Now, this being the case, we can see that a spirit who, when alive, believed in reincarnation, would, after death, continue to believe in it, and he would naturally gather round him or drift into the company of those who also believed in it. In returning through a medium, therefore, he would state dogmatically that reincarnation was true. He would merely express his own belief, which might or might not be true. On many points of this nature, we have no absolute means of arriving at the truth, Spirits tell us their convictions, their beliefs, and these are founded on observation or the wisdom of those spirits who have progressed greatly since their departure from earth. The Doctrine of Zones and Spheres Many spirits teach us that the spirit world is composed of a number of zones and spheres, one upon the other. Some have stated that there are 32 such zones, others 16, but the greater number have declared that there are but seven, beginning with the one nearest the earth, in which are earthbound spirits, and progressing gradually until they are inhabited 
by more and more spiritualized beings. These zones are said to exist one beyond the other, like the various layers of an onion. On the other hand, others tell us that there are no such things as zones or spheres, but that heaven or hell are merely mental states, and that the various degrees of spiritual perfection represent the different zones. They do not occupy space, that is. They exist purely in the mind of the individual. Yet, perhaps, these two may be but two aspects of a single truth. It is only natural to suppose that those of similar interests would gravitate together just as they do in this life and shun the society of others less evolved than themselves, unless they chose voluntarily to help them as occasion arose. This being the case, those more advanced spiritually would congregate in certain places, and those less advanced would gather together in other places, so that although the zones would not exist as physical spheres shut off from each other by physical barriers, as many believe, yet they exist practically, the barrier being a mental or spiritual one, Conditions and Occupations in the Spirit World Spiritualism teaches that the next life is a busy one, that we continue our pursuits, activities, and interests, just as we do here, only under more favorable conditions. Evolution reigns supreme, just as it does in this world. This is only natural and rational, and what we should expect. It is a gradual continuation and process of advancement. The next world is said to be more or less a duplicate of this one. Those who are interested in learning may attend lectures or schools of instruction, may read, write, compose, paint, play, etc., just as they do here. The scenery is more or less similar to the scenery on this earth, although more beautiful and perfect in every respect. We are told that children never enter the lower spheres, nor are there any flowers in these spheres. They are found only in the higher spheres or more advanced stages. These spheres can influence one another more or less directly to a great extent, and particularly the higher spheres can exert a helpful influence on the lower ones. For this reason, progress is always possible for a spirit who desires it. He can secure assistance from those who are more advanced than he is in the spiritual world. His progress would, therefore, be rapid, and it all depends upon individual effort how rapid this will be. The sooner a spirit realizes his own possibilities and the fact that his own future happiness or unhappiness depends upon himself, the more rapidly will he advance. The Spirit Body Spirits tell us that we inhabit in the next life a body similar to the material body, but representing the glow of youth in its strength and purity. The spirit of man is ever young, and that being so, it assumes that rejuvenated outward appearance upon entering the new life. This etheric body is incapable of fatigue and is fed by the magnetic and spiritual forces which surround it in that sphere. Children entering the new life gradually grow to maturity though more rapidly than they do on this earth, because greater advantages are offered them, and progress is consequently swifter. At the age of greatest mental and spiritual maturity, they cease growing, and thenceforward remain in that perfected condition. On entering the spirit world, upon entering the next life, 
The human spirit is met by friends or relatives who have before passed over and who are drawn by natural magnetic attraction and sympathetic interest to those who have just entered the spirit world. When the spirit enters the next life, it undergoes, in a way, a new birth and is for some time bewildered. This is only natural after the shock and wrench of death. When we have had an accident in this life and have been knocked unconscious, the process of regaining consciousness is peculiar. When such a man opens his eyes, objects are presented to him vaguely, indistinctly. He would see men as trees walking. Sounds would be heard, but faintly. There would be a vague jumble of noises, and no definite and articulate sounds would be recognized at first, until consciousness was more fully restored. Thoughts would be scattered, incoherent, and only the strongest stimuli would focus the attention on any definite object for longer than a few moments at a time. When a man dies, the departure of the soul from the body must be as great as a strain upon the surviving consciousness as any accident could be, especially in cases of sudden death, suicide, and in those cases where the patient is said to die hard. Of course, after a little time, the spirit survives the initial shock and soon becomes adjusted to the new environment and condition. And this fact would account for the bewilderment and confusion which many spirits seem to experience upon their entering into the next life. It is only natural and what we should expect. Sex in the spirit world. Many have asked whether the distinction of sex is maintained in the next life whether man continues to be man and woman, woman. Here again, many different opinions have been expressed by those who have passed over, but the majority seem to contend that the distinction between male and female is fundamental, mentally and spiritually, no less than physically. And for this reason, they are destined to be more or less different for all time. This does not mean, as many think, that woman is there, as she is here, too often, in a condition of subservience or inferiority. On the other hand, she is man's equal, in many particulars, in some ways inferior to him, and in some ways superior. It is a question of differing viewpoints and constitution. Each may attain perfection, and ultimate complete happiness in their own particular way, just as every individual here must obtain in his own way. As to the relations of the sexes in the next life, the teaching of the highest spirits is that there is love, harmony, sympathy, cooperation, and a mental and spiritual blending together of their natures, which corresponds to physical love on this plane. Earthbound spirits in the lowest plane are said to be unable to get away from the atmosphere and magnetic attraction of this earth, and do not care to, even if they could. They are the cause of much of the trouble which mediums experience, often causing obsession by delivering false or lying messages. There seems to be a law which permits spirits from the higher zones to descend into the lower zones, but the reverse of this does not take place. Thus, there are good or spiritual influences always playing upon the lower spheres from the higher spheres, and progress is thus rendered easy to those who care to take advantage of their opportunities. Where and how spirits live? Many of the descriptions which have been given to us indicate that spirits inhabit houses or mansions very similar to our own, 
and that the scenery of the spirit land is also similar to that of the earth plane, only more beautiful. Garments of variegated colors are said to be worn, as well as ornaments for those who care for them. The occupations of spirits are many and varied. Time is not spent in the spiritual spheres, as many imagine, in idleness or in religious devotions. How Spirits Talk The spirit body, in the spirit heaven, is thus as material to them as our world, only it exists on a different plane of activity and vibrates at a different rate of activity from ours. Hence, it is invisible to us, as we are usually invisible to them. And it requires clairvoyance on the part of spirits to perceive the material world, just as it does on the part of mortals to perceive the spiritual world. Conversation between spirits is carried on by a species of thought exchange, or telepathy. Though the conversation appears perfectly natural and as though delivered by means of mouth, as it is with us, we can form some idea as to how natural this would be from our dreams when the exchange of thought is purely mental. Yet, the words spoken to each other by the dream figures seem as natural and as sonorous as our usual conversation. Insanity and Spirits There are, strictly speaking, no insane spirits. It is said, except in the earth spheres, and these, previous to their insanity, were degraded spiritually and morally. They frequently continue in some degree insane for a long period of time, their spiritual condition not being favorable to their restoration. And here they are often attracted to mortals with like tendencies whom they obsess and through whom they ventilate their own disordered fancies and even impel them to acts of violence. However, as much insanity is caused by disorders of the links between body and mind, and as these are all severed at the moment of death, the mind is usually normal and sound as soon as it enters the spirit world. And in any case, it recovers very rapidly upon its entrance into that realm. How Spirits Travel Spirits are said to possess the ability to move from place to place with extreme rapidity, the fact as quick as thought, as the saying is. It is as easy for one to imagine oneself in China or in England as it is to imagine oneself in Brooklyn, if one is living in New York. The one process takes no longer than the other, and, as you are in the spirit world, where your thoughts and interests are, you may readily perceive that it takes you no longer to reach one place than it does another. However incredible this may seem at first sight, it is quite intelligible when we remember the rapidity with which wireless messages travel. Flying through space at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, this would carry these waves nearly seven and a half times around the world in one second. And it has been experimentally proven that these electric waves do travel at that rate. Such being the case, we can, at least, conceive that thought can travel at as quick a rate, however inconceivable it may appear to our reason. Good and Evil Spirits we have heard much of obsessing and lying spirits, of evil spirits, and those who work harm. But we must remember that there are spirits of quite another character in the heavens, who are said to protect and guard us, give us wise counsel and advice, and are, in fact, veritable guardian angels. Their duty is to impress our minds and, by this means, to instruct and guide us, to instill good thoughts and resolves, admonish us of our faults, reprove us when we go astray, 
and assist in the development of special talents. They do not interfere directly in the physical world, but impress our minds, influencing them in this way or in that. The Doctrine of Correspondences There is said to be a definite agreement or correspondence between the material and spiritual order of things. What we perceive as a tree in this world is only the outward manifestation of the real spiritual tree lying within it, and this is true of all physical manifestations and facts which we see in nature. Every physical body has a corresponding spiritual body behind it, and this fact gives rise to the famous doctrine of correspondences. Elaborated by Swedenborg, this correspondence throws a little light on the bewildering fact that spirits often speak of spirit gold, spirit marble, spirit houses, spirit books, etc., as if they were tangible realities, not, of course, that these are sublimations of corresponding objects of earth, existent throughout but different as to material, yet sufficiently alike to be called by the same name. In other words, these spirit objects are expressed in a different vehicle of the nature, which is to us, externalized as gold, marble, etc. We must endeavor to realize the reality of the spiritual world, which we have been unaccustomed to think of as in any way substantial owing to the teachings of theology. The Difficulty of Describing the Spirit World it is impossible to express things psychic adequately in direct language for the simple reason that our words are images drawn from material things and their effects. Immaterial things and the life beyond must, therefore, generally be described by symbols rather than by words, and these symbols, whether seen in vision or representing themselves to the mind in the normal state, partake less of the seer's idiosyncrasies than any direct language would do. This symbolism is often carried to a high place in interpretation, so much so that the original is almost lost sight of. Of this, however, we shall speak at length of the chapter devoted to symbolism. There is much evidence to show that spirits can create forms and objects by the mere exercise of their volition. They build up what appear to be solid objects by the use of their minds, and these objects are often mistaken by the spirits for realities. Thus, Thought forms may be created by a spirit intelligence, and this is a fact which many spiritualists have overlooked, though it is an important one as I shall endeavor to show later. Darkness and Light Wrong and evil in some ways seem connected with darkness. Unhappy spirits always complain that they can find no light. But as they progress, the darkness seems to lift, and light begins to dawn. This does not mean that they emerge from a material darkness into a material light, but go through a process of psychic evolution, which would, in their own minds, correspond to this. The quickest way for an unhappy spirit to progress towards the light is for it to help and comfort or assist another in like condition. Unfortunately, they are very often ignorant of this, but fortunately, many spiritualists have done a great deal of good in the seance room, etc., by giving this knowledge to spirits of a low order. Many of the spirits who have passed over, being nearer earth than heaven, soon after their transition, are more easily reached by the living than by other spirits. So far as comfort and advice and assistance are concerned, and for this reason, prayers of the living 
are often of great help to those who have recently passed over and are extremely earthbound by reason of their mental and moral characteristics. Ordinary advice and assistance may also be given to these spirits at a seance. Visits to the Spirit World The Spirit World can occasionally be visited, it is said, by the spirit of the sleeper or the somnambulist, and the deeper the sleep, the more separated from the body is the spirit until in deep trance. The spirit is sometimes entirely withdrawn. In deep sleep, also, the spirit occasionally goes on clairvoyant excursions and comes back to its normal body, remembering much that it has seen in the spiritual realms. In the state of ecstasy, these voyages are often made and the seer will retain a certain amount of consciousness of this earth and be able to dictate to those about him his impressions while visiting the spiritual world and while seeing more or less clearly what is happening there. Spirits are said to exercise free will and have far more liberty of choice in the next world than they do here, where they are bound by habit and tradition no less than by mental and physical obstructions and difficulties. The psychic gifts of spirits are far more highly developed than they were when on this earth, and they are frequently capable of exercising the faculty of foreknowledge or provision, as well as other supernormal powers, such as telepathy, clairvoyance, and clairaudience. Infinite Intelligence They are also able to perceive the general plan of nature far more thoroughly and effectively than we, because they have, so to speak, a greater mental grasp of the universe in its entirety. And many spirits who have died, while disbelieving in an infinite intelligence, have, as time progressed, shown that they have more or less changed their viewpoint and now are more definitely religious than they were before. As Dr. Kroll says, I have constantly been impressed with the numerous proofs of the creative and sustaining power of deity, and step by step I have been led to undoubtedly believe that he, though not in human form, is everywhere present, the creator, preserver, and controller of all things, literally God, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, with whom all wisdom and power and infinite love extends to all his creatures. This is the effect of these investigations upon my mind, and I am disposed to believe that similar and more extended researches by others in the future will lead all true, earnest spiritualists to the same belief, and thus modern spiritualists will be stamped with the higher polity of true religion, with a correct, though necessarily limited, conception of God's character, and of his relations to us, and of ours to him. Shall we see God? However this may be, it is claimed that spirits, for some time after transition, at least do not definitely know anything more about the nature or extent of this infinite intelligence than we do. They do not pass directly into the presence of any deity, as theology tells us. Questioned on this fact, they reply, I do not know. However, as they progress in spiritual perception and understanding, they gradually perceive that the universe, instead of being a chaos due to chance, is orderly and systematic and governed by a supreme or infinite intelligence, which is the guiding principle involved, and that it would only be logical to believe that such an intelligence necessarily existed. The Spirit World, the Source of Energy The spiritual world is the source of all energy. 
Even in this life, our energy is derived from some spiritual source. The nature of life is as yet unknown, and there is every indication that it is due to some spiritual influx acting upon and through the material world. One proof of this is that during the hours of sleep, when the body is resting and passive, the nervous or spiritual energy is revived. The body is recharged, as it were, in the same way as a storage battery might be recharged with electric energy. This process does not depend upon any material condition, for sleep can often revive us instantly, as many can attest. In moments of extreme exhaustion, the head may drop to the breast for a fraction of a second, and a moment later, consciousness be regained. Yet, in that moment of time, some complete spiritual revivification has taken place. The energy of the body seems to have been recharged or replenished, and new energy infused from some spiritual source in a manner which would be quite inexplicable, were we to depend upon the ordinary teachings of science to explain such facts. The phenomena and teachings of spiritualism alike constitute a great solace and comfort to many souls in distress and sorrow. The proof that death does not end all, and that the individual human spirit continues to exist as an entity, and in precisely the same form as it is now, is a great comfort to the majority of persons. In this way, the teachings of spiritualism are a solace to those who accept them. To those who not only believe, but are enabled to obtain some of the varied phenomena, this assurance and consolation is doubly true. The different kinds of spiritual gifts. There are many spiritual gifts, as St. Paul says in his message to the Corinthians. He wrote, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severely as he will. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 how anyone can disbelieve in spirit communication on the ground that it is contrary to Bible teachings after the above passage, it is hard to comprehend, since here are a large number of spirit manifestations clearly outlined and stated by the Apostle to be manifestations of the Divine Spirit. End of Chapter 5 Recorded by Cynthia Sheeler Website, CynthiaSheeler.ICanVoice.com Chapter 6 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Phelps Gonzalez your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington Chapter 6 The Health of Mediums and Psychics The health, bodily, mentally, and spiritually, of mediums is a very important factor in all mediumistic and psychic development, far more so than is usually realized. In the first place, we have a certain amount of bodily energy in order to accomplish anything we desire in life, 
and this energy comes largely from physical health. Mediums have found to their cost that the production of phenomena, especially of the physical order, is at times a very exhausting process, and unless they keep themselves in good bodily health, they discover that they become run down and nervously exhausted, in which case they render themselves subject to insomnia, depressing mental emotions, and if this gets worse, to obsession and even greater dangers and difficulties. It is very important, therefore, for all mediums to keep up their physical health. A healthy brain. The mind of man depends largely upon the condition of his brain, and if this is not rested, freshened, and supplied in abundance with rich, healthy blood, his mental life suffers in consequence, for we know that any poisonous substance mixed with the blood immediately affects the mind by circulating through the delicate substance of the brain. The tiny nerve cells all over the body, which are the storehouses of energy, may be compared to a number of tiny cups which we fill with energy every night during sleep and more or less empty every day. Our duty is to keep these little cups brimful, and if we allow them to become too emptied so that nothing is left, we run into danger of nervous exhaustion, neurasthenia, etc. The first thing which the medium must pay attention to is, therefore, the state of his physical health, and the following rules will be found helpful by all those who wish to attain this condition. Deep Breathing Exercises in the first place, a certain number of deep breathing exercises should be taken every day. These serve to keep the lungs active and to massage the internal organs. But deep breathing exercises have a more potent and far-reaching effect than this. There is a peculiar life-giving property in fresh air, and if we do not breathe this fully, we never live as completely and receive as large a supply of the vital and magnetic currents of the universe as we otherwise would. If any one doubts this, he has but to stand erect and take half a dozen deep breathing exercises as directed below, and he will feel energized from top to toe. The way to take these breathing exercises so as to get the best results is as follows. 1. How to breathe. Stand before an open window or out of doors, free from all restrictive clothing. Before beginning, exhale forcibly, bending the body forward and relaxing the muscles. Place both open hands over the abdomen. Now breathe as deeply as possible against these hands, expanding the abdomen as much as possible without allowing the chest or ribs to expand in the least. In other words, breathe with abdomen only. After you have done this five or six times, place both your hands against your ribs on either side. Now breathe in deeply, pressing out the ribs, but without allowing either the abdomen or the upper chest to expand. After you have done this five or six times, place your hands on the upper chest, just below the neck, and breathe with this portion of the lungs, without allowing either the ribs or the abdomen to expand. At first you will find it very difficult to control your breathing, limiting it to these parts of the lungs, but this will come with practice, and it will be shown later in Chapter 41 how important these breathing exercises are, when the psychic side of the breathing exercises is understood. The Psychic Complete Breath after you have mastered these three separate steps, you will be enabled to take what is known as a complete breath, that is, one which expands first the abdomen, then the ribs, then the upper chest. You should by this time have such control over your breathing that you are enabled to do this in three distinct stages, or merge them together into one as you wish. In all these breathing exercises, the back of the nasal passage should be relaxed, and you should breathe through the nose, never the mouth, as though you were smelling a flower. If you do this and relax inwardly, you will find that the air strikes the back of the throat before it is felt at all, and you will never notice the air in the nose itself. Practice this every day until you become proficient. The best way to ensure this is to close the lips while keeping the teeth separated, then throw down the under portion of the jaw. Developing Exercises 2. A certain amount of exercise should be taken each day. The particular character of exercise, which will be found beneficial for the maintenance of health, also for development of psychic and mediumistic gifts, are those which develop the vitality of the inner organs about the waistline. Bending exercises of all kinds are especially useful. Large muscles are not required for good health, but energy and endurance are. The following four exercises will be found very helpful in this connection. A. Stand erect, raising both arms over the head as far as possible. Raise yourself on your toes and, at the same time, stretch upwards with the fingertips as far as you can, as though trying to lengthen yourself. B. 
Stand as before, arms raised over the head. Now bend forward and try to touch the floor with your fingertips without bending the knees. Again, raise yourself up to a standing position very rapidly. This is a well-known but very useful exercise. C. Stand as in exercise B and bend the body sideways from the waist as far as possible. First to the left, then to the right. Make this motion as rapid as you can. D. Stand as before and bend slowly, trying to touch the floor with the fingers. As you do this, take in a deep breath. The purpose of this exercise is to compress the liver from above and below at the same time, and this massage will prove very helpful. Health Hints Other points to be observed in maintaining good health are the following. 1. Eat as little red meat as you can, since this is acknowledged by all to retard psychic development. 2. Eat a certain amount of fruit every day, not in addition to other food, but in place of it. Acid fruits are particularly beneficial in nearly all cases. 3. Drink at least a quart of water each day. 4. Accustom the body to cool baths. It is best to begin these in the summertime and continue them in the winter. 5. Wear as little clothing as you can, consistent with warmth. The skin breathes as well as the lungs, and free circulation of air on the surface is essential. The Powers of the Mind We now come to the mental factor. Few realize how important this is in the development of psychic gifts. If the mind be depressed, worried, scattered, and unable to concentrate upon any definite thing, good results can hardly be hoped for in any way of psychic development. Many psychics can obtain good results for individual sitters, but as soon as they make a public appearance they fail more or less completely. We can hardly doubt that the reason for this is their apprehension for the results, fear they will not succeed, etc. This prevents all free communication. It shuts the doors of the soul, as it were, against any outside influences. In order to be receptive and sensitive, we must have a free mind and give ourselves up wholly to those forces and vibrations which play upon us. If you watch yourself, you will find that your body tends to contract all over as soon as you think certain thoughts, or experience certain emotions, such as jealousy, hatred, envy, etc. On the other hand, as soon as you send out thoughts of friendship, love, sympathy, etc., you find that your whole being expands and relaxes. If this is true of the muscles of the body, how much more true it is of the muscles of the soul, if I may so express it? The imagination, it has been said, is the lungs of the spiritual life, and in order to have free play they must be unrestricted, just as our physical lungs are. The essence of psychic development is this complete surrender and quiescence, and until this is ensured, full development can hardly be expected. There is such a thing as spiritual contraction. We have all heard of the man with the ingrowing conscience. This means simply that this man is dwarfed contracted and unsympathetic in his attitude to all that he meets. Gentleness and cheerfulness, said Robert Louis Stevenson, are the perfect duties, and we cannot do better than advise the medium to follow this motto in his daily life. Psychic Contagion These influences which are harmful in ourselves are harmful when experienced in others, and they are contagious to a remarkable degree. All experienced spiritualists know that a medium is liable to take on the conditions of the spirit or of another person when in a sensitive state, and this is true of his mental and spiritual life as well as his physical health. We can acquire the other's irritable disposition, his sourness and lack of balance, for the time being, just as easily as we can acquire other symptoms. And unless this is recognized, and the medium takes care to throw off these influences, they are liable to remain with him more or less and influence him, just as we sometimes experience the after-influence of a bad dream in the daytime. How to choose a good developing medium The practical conclusion to be drawn from all this is that it is very dangerous to the mental and moral health of a psychic to develop under the guidance of a medium who is mentally, morally, physically, or spiritually ill for these conditions will possibly sooner or later be taken on, and they are liable to influence the medium to his own detriment. Be most careful, therefore, in selecting the psychic under whom you develop, for your own future progress and happiness will depend largely upon that. End of chapter 6 Recording by Lisa Phelps Gonzalez, Minneapolis, Minnesota
Chapter 7 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Herbert Carrington Chapter 7 Know thyself was the mandate of the Delphic Oracle. Before man can undertake to govern and control external forces, he must learn to control those within himself, for only by doing this can success be attained. Man utilizes his mind as he would a tool every day of his life. The better we understand our tools, the better workmen we are. Hence, he who would succeed must understand the workings of his own nature. The Cosmic Currents First of all, we are told that there are cosmic currents playing to and fro in the world contradictory currents or streams of thought into which we are liable to enter unconsciously, even against our will. Some of these currents are beneficial, others are harmful. Some natures are strong to stem the tide and achieve success against the greatest obstacles. Others can extricate themselves but partially others do not do so at all for this reason we have the successes and the failures in life it depends partly upon outside influences partly upon ourselves the first we cannot control except indirectly through ourselves how to make a success of your life here is the explanation of a great fallacy which many people make they imagine that they can be their own will mold circumstance to soothe themselves this is only partly true let me explain we must not turn our power of mind upon others we must turn it upon ourselves in such a way that it will make us stronger more positive more capable and more efficient and as we develop in this manner success will come of itself the way to control circumstances is to control the forces within yourself to make a greater man of yourself and as you become greater and more competent you will naturally gravitate into better circumstances we should remember that like attracts like for as dr larson says those people who fail and who continue to fail all along the line fail because the power of their minds is either in a habitual negative side or is always misdirected if the power of mind is not working positively and constructively for a certain goal you are not going to succeed if your mind is not positive it is negative and negative minds float with the stream we must remember that we are in the midst of all kinds of circumstances some of which are for us and some of which are against us and we will either have to make our own way or drift and if we drift we go wherever the stream goes but most of the streams of human life are found to flow into the world of the ordinary and the inferior therefore if you drift you will drift with the inferior and your goal will be failure the three laws of success 
in order to achieve mental and spiritual success three rules must be observed which are of prime importance the first is that you must have in your mind a clear conception of what you want if you have not any definite goal in view you cannot expect to achieve any great success because you will be constantly wasting your energy in byways without directing it all towards one certain point the second is you must make your thinking positive and not negative this does not mean that you must grind your teeth frown and try to dominate everyone you meet it means that you possess a calm self-assurance and the inner conviction and the certainty that you will succeed physically this state of things may be felt in a full firm sensation throughout the nervous system the third rule is all your thinking must be constructive that is built about the goal or object you have in mind if you spend only a fraction of your energy of thought in any one direction you cannot expect to progress very far in that line the runner who tries at the same time to work out a mathematical problem in his head will not be first in the race constructive thinking means that you must consistently and continually think of and about what you wish to accomplish the sooner you learn to do this the sooner will success be yours obstacles in life present great difficulties up to a certain point they may be looked upon as helps to character and progress and the more these are overcome the stronger will your character ultimately be at the same time this may be overdone and there is such a thing as kicking against the pricks flowing with the tide if you're striving your best and every man knows in his heart when he is doing his best to accomplish a certain thing and more and more difficulties seem to multiply the further you progress you may under certain conditions assume that it is not meant for you at this particular time to do this particular thing and you may shortly look back and see how you were prevented from undertaking something that might have proven disastrous in this way it is possible to float with these currents instead of stemming them to advantage mrs town tells us that she at one period of her life could do nothing on account of her desire to rest and sleep she determined that she would give this full play she went to bed and stayed there for fourteen days and nights at the end of that time she felt that at last she had had enough rest and thence forward work became a joy instead of a burden it proved to be the turning point in her life acting for our ultimate good there are therefore cosmic currents swaying to and fro flowing back and forth throughout the psychic universe and the more we can sense or become receptive to these currents the more will our life be guided and directed for us by an intelligent control greater than our own we all think that we know exactly what we want to do and what is best for us yet this is not always the case to a mind vaster and more inclusive than ours the more opposite of this may seem better for our ultimate good for example a dog has to have a tooth extracted the painful operation of removing the tooth is all that the dog can see 
to him it is all painful nothing beneficial to us on the contrary who see not only what a dog sees but more it is clear that the dog will eventually be better for the removal of his tooth though it is a painful experience applied to ourselves it is most probably true that our painful experiences in life can be interpreted in a similar manner and that many of them could we see them in that light for our ultimate good how these laws apply to psychic development now let us apply what we have learned to psychic development and the cultivation of mediumistic gifts we have found that there are magnetic and spiritual forces playing upon us from different directions here and there all over the world some of these are for our own good others are not we must learn to become sensitive to these currents which are beneficial to us and shut out those which are not how are we to do this in the first place it is necessary for the student who really desires to obtain this guidance to make certain renunciations or sacrifices he cannot be in the world and at the same time receive the spiritual perfection one cannot both eat one's cake and have it so you must make up your mind just what you wish to do many mediums unfortunately do not develop along these lines the cultivation of the spiritual self is not altogether the same thing as a cultivation of the psychic self obtaining psychic phenomena the one great reproach which has been made against many mediums and spiritualists is that spiritualists are everything but spiritual doubtless this is not true of spiritualists any more than the followers of any other religious faith human nature is weak and we all fall from grace but we are now only talking of those who sincerely desire personal spiritual enlightenment and who are willing to make some sacrifices in order to obtain it to those who are anxious to follow this path we would say that it is unwise to give two full directions thus early in your development this is a question which will be discussed more fully in chapter 42 for the present a few practical points may be helpful both in your daily life and your psychic unfoldment rules to follow as is so often insisted upon the health must be maintained if this is not done you render yourself liable to nervous exhaustion and through this to obsession your clear common sense and interest in the things of the world must to a certain extent be kept otherwise the judgment will become unbalanced cultivate sympathy harmony interest in your fellow beings cultivate your own sensitiveness along ordinary psychic lines by various special exercises when you obtain a certain number of psychic phenomena in this way you will be far more receptive than you were before cultivate at all times what may be called a listening attitude of the soul this is particularly important and practically valuable when you are in doubt upon any question retire to a quiet room and ask your own higher self what is the best thing for you to do at first these replies will be very vague and indistinct but as you progress in your development you will find that they will become clearer and clearer 
and you will soon get definite and clearly formed replies in answer to this mental questioning as soon as you have progressed thus far you may be sure that you have begun to sense the cosmic currents which flow about you and when once you have done this it is thenceforward only a matter of personal development this will be dealt with more fully in several of the chapters which follow end of chapter 7、eight of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nancy beard your psychic powers and how to develop them by harward carrington chapter eight the cultivation of spiritual gifts there are two ways of regarding any particular fact the first is to observe it from without the second is to experience it from within if we look at an orange we observe it from without and we could never experience it from within unless we were the orange the only things that can experience sensations from within in this way are minds each mind can inwardly experience and see objectively its own sensations and as so far as we know it is the only thing in the world which can do so all psychic experience is therefore inward or sensitive and can never be felt by another person but must be experienced by him in order that he should appreciate and understand the mental state you yourself are experiencing it is the same with psychic phenomena if any one experiences any phenomena of this character he can never impart this knowledge to others except in a very roundabout way and for these others to understand the phenomena they themselves must experience them it is for this reason that it is so difficult for psychics to express and explain to outsiders the character of the sensations and phenomena they are experiencing everything being so largely symbolic and our language being so poor in this direction it is often very difficult for them to explain precisely what they mean developing mediumship we do not know as yet exactly what mediumship is there is much evidence to show that it is very often hereditary and runs through three or four generations just like any other gift with some mediumship appears in childhood and seems to be a very part of their constitution the majority however develop it later on in life as the result of coming into contact with mediums or developing it within themselves by experiments some retain their mediumship throughout life others experience it only for a few months a few weeks a few days in some cases only a few seconds in some cases mediumship is terminated suddenly in other cases it is gradually lost through a period of years one who has at any time experienced mediumship can usually recall it by reason of its persistence no matter how long afterwards controlling phenomena in mediumship or when obtaining psychic phenomena of any character we are as yet experimenting as it were with forces and laws as yet largely unknown just as the early scientists experimented with electricity indeed we do not yet know what electricity is however at the present day we can control it perfectly 
and it is to be hoped that the time will come when mediumship and all psychic phenomena can be controlled in a similar manner, even though we may never know the innermost essence of psychic power. If we could do that, it would be, at any rate, on a workable basis, so to speak. Mediumistic Exercises All mediumistic exercises develop this power to some extent, but in different directions. The following are a few of the methods which may be pursued in cultivating and developing the psychic self and the inner spiritual center of our being, as distinct from purely physical phenomena. As before said, it is essential that we should understand and control ourselves before we endeavor to control outside forces. Much may be learned through what is known as introspection, that is, the turning inward of the attention upon the inner self, instead of outward upon the external world. If you close your eyes and do this and try to find out the nature of your true inner being, you will probably experience a peculiar sensation. You will find that, like happiness, it continually eludes you and that when you think you have grasped your own self, it is only a state of mind which has since passed and is now only a memory. Practice this introspection for a few minutes each day, and before long you will be surprised at your development in this direction, for you will be enabled to come into far closer touch with yourself than formerly. The inner self will become illuminated, as it were. Mastering the Self this practice will lead to the habit of escaping from our sense perceptions to which most of us are slaves. As you get away from these and are enabled to withdraw more and more fully into your inner self, you will experience a sensation of reality and the ability to perceive the truth of things in a manner hitherto undreamed of. Truth exists. We do not perceive it for the simple reason that the veil of sense is between it and us. Lift this veil, and you will perceive truth clearly, as in the light of day. This practice of acquiring greater mastery over self will also put you more closely in touch with the great magnetic power currents of the universe, so that you will never feel exhausted or in need of nervous energy there being an unlimited supply of energy in this universe. All we have to do is to learn to tap it, which we can do by these methods of psychic development, and we can draw upon it in any quantity we choose. We will also be put in touch with higher conditions. How Spirit Unites Us with increased spiritual development and spiritual life, we will perceive that there is a universal brotherhood of mankind, and that nothing is really separated from anything else, that we are not separated from our neighbor, but that we are united in the great universal infinite intelligence which combines all. We may compare ourselves to trees in this respect, each tree is apparently a separate being, whose leaves whisper to one another, and whose branches sometimes touch in the swaying of the evening breezes. But their roots are sunk deep into the ground, and are often intertwined with another, while the common earth unites them all. In a similar way, we are united in the spiritual universe of which we form a part fundamentally, physically, we are united one with another. Meditation Meditation may be considered one of the methods by means of which we awaken the inner self and frequently awaken our spiritual or astral senses, so as to cause them to function on another plane. At the same time, if this developing process is done properly, we build up walls of power about ourselves which others will find it impossible to break through, 
by mental or hypnotic influence, even should they desire to do so. We cover ourselves with a sphere of energy through which nothing can pass against our will. The Power of Thought All thoughts sent out by us into the universe have some definite purpose and have a certain effect both upon ourselves and upon others. Thoughts are things. We can create a thought as surely as we can create a house or a chair. And, once created, there is no telling where this thought may stop or how lasting its actions may be. If these thoughts are good, helpful, and useful, they often return to us like boomerangs with the added happiness and power which they have accumulated from others of a similar character in their flight through space. On the contrary, evil thoughts come back to us in the same way, and it will be found that they always return to their sender, with added power for evil or for good. See to it, therefore, that you only send out thoughts of the highest and best. Some people when they first realize this fact, are almost afraid at first to think at all, for fear of the effects their thoughts may have. But this is a great mistake. Expression is the first law of life. We must learn to express. Express. The chief outward difference between a living being and a corpse is that one can express itself and the other cannot. Do not be afraid to express yourself fully and forcibly in any direction. Even the bodily expression of our feelings and emotions is quite justified. There is nothing to be ashamed of in conviction or in passion. It is the abuse of these which is detrimental. The Use of the Will In a similar way, the power of the will may be used for good or for evil, as the case may be, and it has a great power in both directions, as the history of occultism has shown us. In the one case we have, as the result of the exercise of this power, various psychic phenomena, marvelous cures, and all the varied accomplishments of this world. On the other hand, we have the phenomena of witchcraft, black magic, harmful absent treatment, and crime. It all depends into which channel we direct the energy of our will. The soul must learn to find and experience itself fully before it can consider itself thoroughly alive and a fully developed entity. After this realization has been accomplished, then an then only should we direct our attention to cultivating and directing the latent energies which we possess. Self-Development Essential It is because of this fact that self and soul culture is necessary before psychic phenomena are cultivated to any great extent. We must learn to know ourselves, to preserve a just and careful balance of judgment, sympathy, understanding, and intuition. If we do not possess these qualities, we shall never become mediums on the highest plane. On the contrary, we may draw to ourselves while developing mediumship harmful or lying intelligences which we have attracted into our magnetic aura. So, I cannot too strongly advise and warn you to practice these self-developing exercises before cultivating external psychic or mediumistic powers. Mediumship opens the doors to influence and powers over which we have little control, and we must be sure that, before the doors of the soul are swung back, we must be prepared to receive whoever enters, by reason of our own self-control and inner powers. Otherwise, we may be unable to close the doors when we wish to, or the door of reason may become altogether unhinged. 
in giving these warnings i do not wish to frighten the reader since there is no necessity to become alarmed if caution be exercised in this development only i wish to emphasize the necessity for this caution end of chapter eight recording by nancy beard kingston new york Chapter 9 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harewood Carrington. Chapter 9 Psychometry. What is psychometry? Dr. J. Rhodes Buchanan says, The word psychometry, coined in 1842 to express the character of a new science and art, is the most pregnant and important word that has been added to the English language, coined from the Greek psyche, soul, and metron, measure. It literally signifies soul measuring. In our modern use of the word, however, it means something a little different from this. A psychic who picks up an object and in connection with it gets certain psychic impressions is said to psychometrize the object, and this process is known as psychometry. Experiments The famous Professor Denton, a mineralogist, whose wife possessed remarkable powers in this direction, conducted a number of experiments, some of which are described as follows. He gave his wife a specimen from the Carboniferous Formation. Closing her eyes, she described swamps and trees with their tufted heads and scaly trunks, with the great frog-like animals that existed in that age. He got a specimen of the lava that flowed from the volcano in Hawaii in 1848. His sister, by its means, described a boiling ocean, a cataract of golden lava that almost equaled Niagara in size. A small fragment of a meteorite that fell at Painesville, Ohio, was given to his wife's mother, a sensitive who did not then believe in psychometry. This is what she said. I seem to be traveling away, away through nothing right forward. I see what looks like stars and mist. I seem to be taken right up. The other specimens take me down. His wife independently gave a similar description but saw it revolving and its tail of sparks. Not due to telepathy. Professor Denton took steps to prove that this was not mind-reading by wrapping the specimens in paper, shaking them up in a hat, and allowing the sensitive to pick out one and describe it, without anyone knowing which one it was. Among them was a fragment of brick from ancient Rome, antimony from Borneo, silver from Mexico, basalt from Fingal's cave. Each place was described correctly by the sensitive in the most minute detail. These are but examples which could be multiplied, did space permit. Nearly everyone possesses a certain amount of power in this direction, and it only needs cultivation to bring it to light. Before proceeding to the practical side of this question, a few words of explanation of the theory involved will doubtless be of interest to the student. The Explanation it has been said that every object possesses its own peculiar psychic influence, fluid, or aura, which may be recognized by one sensitive enough to perceive it. Human beings may transfer a certain amount of this fluid to objects, leaving them impressed with their influence. We see this in the case of magnetic cures, and in some cases of haunted houses. In fact, as we shall see in Chapter 28, devoted to that subject, this is one of the theories which has been advanced to explain haunted houses. Objects which have been worn close to the skin, or which have been brought into contact for a long time with the magnetism of any particular person, seem to retain a large share of this aura, and such objects may readily be psychometrized. Their aura may be read and interpreted according to the ability of the psychic. We often see demonstrations of this character given in public. 
Again, trance mediums are very sensitive to influences of this character, and if we place an object which has belonged to some person who has recently passed over into the hands of a good trance medium, he will frequently be enabled to get into contact with that person through the magnetism of the article in question, and in that way information may be obtained which otherwise could not have been secured. How to Preserve the Influence Articles of this character often lose their properties, their virtue we might almost express it, by being left around or exposed to the handling of others. And for this reason it is best to keep such articles carefully wrapped up in thin rubber cloth which may be procured from any drug store. In this way their properties are preserved. Just what this influence is, with which the articles become impregnated, we are unable to say. Probably it is a form of the vital force which animates the universe. Yet, even supposing that this could flow into the object, and that the psychic could sense it, we have yet to explain why it should be that this particular vital energy should be enabled to arouse within the psychic the flood of information he receives. Akasic Records Professor Draper has said, A shadow never falls upon a wall without leaving thereon a permanent trace, a trace made visible by resorting to proper processes. On the walls of private apartments, where we think the eye of intrusion is altogether shut out, and our retirement can never be profaned, there exist the records of our acts, silhouettes of whatever we have done. It is a crushing thought to whoever has committed secret crime, that the picture of his deed and the very echo of his words may be seen and heard countless years after he has gone the way of all flesh. There are certain analogies for this in the physical world. If sunlight falls upon a sheet of paper, and we place upon it a key, the outline of this key will be marked upon the paper, and may be recovered years later, by suitable means. If thoughts are things, they doubtless impress our surroundings in much the same way, and the objects which we psychometrize are influenced by means of our thoughts, and the human aura or fluid, so that they retain them within it, and may be read back by the sensitive. The Interpretation of Impressions Received In all psychometry we must remember that the interpretation of the impressions received is largely symbolic, just as the printed word of a book is symbolic of the thought of the author lying behind it. So impressions stored within objects and sensed by the psychic must also be symbolic, and must be suitably interpreted by the psychometrist. Thus, when he places a geological specimen on his forehead, and describes an antediluvian monster, roaring and walking about, no one but a very shallow individual would imagine for a moment that the psychometrist was actually seeing the original. He simply got an impression of that era of the world's history, and symbolized it subconsciously in the form of this roaring monster. In obtaining impressions from an object, we must endeavor to become as receptive and sensitive as possible. A few preliminary exercises will enable you to do this to much better advantage than you otherwise would be enabled to. Exercises for Developing Sensitiveness 1. Cultivate the sensitiveness of your fingertips. You may do this effectively by placing in a bowl water of the same temperature as the body. Now close your eyes and place your fingertips just above the surface of the water. Without looking, very gradually lower the fingertips until they come into contact with the water. See whether you can tell when this is the case. You will be surprised to discover that, at first, you are quite unable to tell when you have touched the water. 2. Another good exercise is to take a pair of compasses, and, opening them a quarter of an inch or so, touch the fingertips with the two sharp points, the eyes being closed. See if you can tell how far apart these points are, before looking at the compasses. In this way, your fingers will acquire a sensitiveness of their own. 3. Learn to act upon first impressions. Do not hesitate or be afraid to express exactly how you feel and the impression that comes to you, no matter how ridiculous it may be. There is a useful saying which may help you in this respect. It is, The first thought is the spirit's. The second is your own. So learn to act on first impressions and put into execution immediately anything which comes to you. 4. 
analyze your own sensations and emotions as best you can, after the first impression has been received, and see what you feel or experience within yourself. Then express this in words to the best of your ability. These emotions often express, in that form, facts which could not well be expressed in any other way, though they apparently have no connection with the object. For example, if you are feeling a watch, and you get in connection with that watch the feeling of depression and pain in the throat, state this fully, since the person who owned the watch may have strangled himself in a fit of melancholy. In this way, the emotions you perceive are fully in accord with the sensations which you receive from the object. Its Practical Value in Daily Life The practice of psychometry will often enable you to tell the characteristics of another living person, and by this means you will be enabled to tell whether or not you will like such a person, because you may be attracted or repelled by the psychic impressions you receive in connection with the object such a person has been wearing. In practical life, information of this character is at times very useful. In addition to all this, the cultivation of psychometry is often useful in paving the way for the cultivation of other psychic phenomena, and will prove a useful introduction to them. End of chapter 9 Recording by Jeannie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland Chapter 10 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Louise. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 10 The Human Aura. Surrounding every living body, and some non living materials, there is a halo or aura which may be seen under certain exceptional conditions. Clairvoyants have always contended that they could see this aura surrounding human beings, but they were laughed at for their pains by the majority of scientists who continued to disbelieve in its existence. About the middle of the nineteenth century, Baron von Richtenbach published a book on the aura, paying particular attention to the emanations which his sensitives had seen coming from crystals and the poles of horseshoe magnets. It is now known that both magnets and crystals give off a very noticeable aura, and this may be seen by anyone possessing even moderate psychic development, if they observe these objects when placed in a darkened room. How studied by the aid of chemical screens. Needless to say, all this was disbelieved at the time, and it was not until 1911 that the existence of the aura was proved scientifically by means of mechanical and chemical means. Dr. Kilner, the electrician of St. Thomas Hospital, London, then showed that it is possible for anyone to see the aura issuing from a living human being by means of especially prepared glass slides containing a chemical named dicyanin. The subject of the experiment is placed against a white or black cloth background in a nearly darkened room and must be at least partially nude as the aura cannot be seen through the clothing. The investigator then looks through one of the chemical screens at the daylight. Then, closing his eyes, pulls down the blind so as to make the room nearly dark. In this light the figure of the model can be seen only faintly, and if the subject is looked at through the glass screen, the aura may be seen by nearly anyone possessing good eyesight. In this case, the investigator does not have to be a clairvoyant, since the eyes are rendered susceptible to certain artificial light waves by means of the chemical screens. Usually our eyes cannot perceive these waves. In this way, the skeptical world has been convinced of the reality of the human aura, and it is now considered a proved scientific fact. The three auras thus disclosed. The human aura, or atmosphere, consists of a number of layers or strata, one beyond the other, extending out into space. By means of Dr. Kilner's chemical screens, three of these divisions may be clearly perceived. First, what is called the etheric double, this is seen like a dark line, slightly grayish in color, which extends over the whole surface of the body, conforming exactly to its shape. Doubtless, this is one manifestation of the double or etheric body. Beyond this extends the inner aura, which is usually two or three inches broad. It conforms to the contour of the body throughout, and is more or less colored by the health of the individual and by the mental or emotional states which may be present at that time. 
Beyond this again is the outer aura, beginning where the inner aura ceases and extending from three to six inches as a rule before it becomes invisible. It extends slightly further in the case of women than it does in men. This aura is very variable and is greatly influenced by all the mental and psychic conditions of the person to whom it belongs. Its colors vary also very greatly, but this cannot as a rule be seen through the screens because they themselves are either dark red or blue. It takes a trained clairvoyant to see all the subtle gradations and variations of color in the aura. How to train your psychic sight. The best way to train yourself to see auras of this character is perhaps the following. 1. In a darkened room, study the aspect of a good horseshoe magnet, either suspended in the air by a silk thread or placed on a support with poles up, and vary the position of the observation until a faint luminosity is observed at the poles and along the edges of the magnet. 2. In the light, repeat the same process, trying to make out these lines and the extensions and limitations of the aura. It must be understood that this vision can be obtained artificially only through the action of the will, and by a proper focusing of the eyes, the perception of auras requiring a very different focus from ordinary sight, and this focusing is very often, nearly always in fact, different in each of the two eyes. The attempted focusing of the sight must therefore be made with each eye separately, and then with both combined. It may happen that one eye only can be focused for this special vision, or when both are found available, if both focuses are not identical, the active use of both eyes at one time may destroy the psychic sight of the sensitive eye. The Aura in Daylight and Darkness It is important to master the faculty of seeing the magnetic aura in the daylight, because more complete details can thus be eventually obtained than in the dark, and this is the only way to learn how to perceive the human aura. For the purpose of trying one's vision in broad daylight, take a good horseshoe magnet and hold it perpendicularly in front of you, either against the background of an open outside light, such as can be obtained from looking out from the inside of a room through an open window, or against a near inside background, for instance a white or dark wall, according to the nature of the light. Then look at the edge of the magnet with one eye only, and gradually approach it or slide it away from you, until you obtain the best focus of vision. Look steadily along the same point, until it dawns on you that a kind of a quivering narrow band of mist or vapor is flowing from the metal and prevents your sight from freely perceiving the object back of it, producing in fact a sort of bending of your visual rays. As soon as you realize the presence on the edge of the magnet of this current of vaporous mist, which may be compared to the appearance of the heated air which arises in summertime from hot fields, the first psychic visual victory has been obtained and the perception of the other phenomena connected with the aura will only need time, perseverance, and practice. And once the magnet is conquered, one may expect to speedily obtain the sight of the beautiful and intricate currents on the human body. The Structure of the Aura After the aura has been perceived and its general layers distinguished, the student must turn his attention to its structure and color variations. The question of color will be treated in the next chapter, which is devoted entirely to that subject. As to the structure or composition of the aura, if this be studied carefully, it will be found that it is composed in a great variety of different ways, according to the object or person emitting it. Thus, the aura of flowers is very different to that of magnets or human beings. The Aura of Flowers it is a very interesting study to try and perceive psychically the composition of the aura of various flowers. For instance, that of the violet is about one-eighth of an inch in thickness and composed first of a bright light, then a line of dark blue, shading away into a very light blue, all these following the contour of the edge of the leaf. Above these lines is a scalloped or semi-linear string or border of two rows of little purplish-red figures, diamond-shaped, very regularly distributed, so as to form two sets of fourteen little diamonds over the space of each small lobe of the leaf. Then, above these, a wave of dark blue mist in crescent form, shading off into light blue. This is only a sample reading of one flower. Each flower has its own particular aura, some of them being very complex, but it will serve to show the student how interesting a study this can be made. The study of the aura of plants alone, carefully undertaken, would occupy considerable time. The Human Aura and How to Study It After you have studied the auras of magnets and plants in this way, 
you should turn your attention to the auras of living human beings. Children may easily be studied, and their auras are exceedingly interesting. Developed clairvoyants are enabled to see several different auras, each of them being composed of a number of subdivisions, and each subdivision having a different structure and color. It is a good plan to begin the study of the aura by the aid of the chemical screens before mentioned, in semi-darkness, and then to practice viewing the aura without the screens, and, as the eyes gain sensitiveness, to admit more and more light, until it can be clearly seen in the daylight. In this way, your psychic sight will be gradually and naturally developed. End of chapter 10 Recording by Catherine Louise Chapter 11 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Gon Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington Chapter 11 Color and Its Interpretation In the last chapter we learned that there is a psychic atmosphere or aura surrounding each animate object, and particularly human beings, and that both the structure and the color of this varies greatly. We must now inquire first into the nature of these colorings, and secondly try to solve the question, what do they mean? How are we to interpret these colors, realizing that they are but symbols of something which they merely express? The color of every individual is doubtless somewhat different, and with the same individual it differs at various times, according to his state of health, the mental and psychical changes, etc. The majority of highly developed clairvoyants agree, however, with C. W. Leadbeater, that the following colors may be distinguished, and that they signify the existing physical, mental, and spiritual conditions as follows. The meaning of various colors. Black indicates hatred and malice. Anger and hate thought forms are like heavy smoke. Red Deep red flashes on black ground show anger. Lurid red indicates sensuality. Brown. Dull brown red shows avarice. Dull hard brown gray selfishness. Greenish brown. With red or scarlet flashes denotes jealousy. Gray. Heavy leaden shows deep depression. Livid gray shows fear. Crimson indicates love. Orange pride or ambition. Yellow shows intellectuality. Duller tints show it is used for selfish purposes. Green. Deep blue-green shows good qualities, deep sympathy, while gray-green shows deceit and cunning. Blue. Dark indicates religious feeling. Light blue shows devotion to a noble spiritual ideal. White or near-white shows high spirituality. Dull brown and blue show selfish religious feeling. Dull yellow, low type intellect. Apricot shows pride. Brick red indicates selfish affection and avarice. Light and bright red show pure affection. Grayish green with reddish tinge shows deceit. The health aura is clearly visible to the clairvoyant as a mass of faintly luminous violet gray mist interpenetrating the denser part of the human body and extending very slightly beyond. It is easy to understand how almost infinite may be the combinations and modifications of all these hues, so that the most delicate graduation of character, or the most evanescent of mingled feelings, may be expressed with the greatest accuracy. Many of the colors are unknown to our physical faculties, so that it is impossible to picture them with psychic hues. When a clairvoyant sees these colors in the aura or surroundings of an individual, therefore, he may feel that the characteristica indicated are present, and the same thing is true when they are to be seen in the surroundings of a returning spirit. The Seven Auras Surrounding Man When the advanced student carefully studies the human aura, he will find that there are a number of straight, white, very fine lines emanating from the body, and particularly the head, which resemble rays of white light. These are magnetic rays, which do not deal directly with the psychical condition of the subject. The innermost aura will be found to consist of five different colored bands. The first will be pure white, the second light blue, the third darker blue, the fourth lemon yellow, the fifth dark red. 
the second layer of the aura will be found to be bluish violet merging into rose those two interpenetrate one another forming very beautiful combinations the third layer consists of three cloudy zones the first pink the second violet and the third orange the fourth layer consists of green cloud-like waves tinged with yellow resembling the golden edges of clouds behind which the sun is shining the fifth will be seen to be slate or indigo in color with silver edges the sixth will consist of a beautiful light blue with a whitish golden fringe the seventh or outermost aura will be seen to be a grayish mist of a light violet tint the outer aura completes the auric emanation of man and is the outer shell as it were consisting of the so-called auric egg surrounding every human being of which more will be said later changes in the colors when a golden yellow light is seen about the head it may be assumed that such an individual has great intellectuality combined with spirituality and in some cases it has been said that this contains a cloud of gold dusk each speck revolving spirally on itself these colors of various auras are not unchanging as before said so that the student must not expect to see them exactly as described they are greatly modified by the mental and psychical condition of the subject and the thoughts and emotions which the latter may be experiencing at the time of observation will also affect the aura the colors of thoughts thus fear gives rise to circles of bright rings spread out in the form of a cone of varying shades of gray pink and purple a beautiful devotional thought may be expressed in the form of a star of bluish mist tinged with yellow pity may be seen as a reddish violet cloud from which issue pointed cones of a brighter pink deception will give rise to a steel blue mist tinged with pink and taking the shape of any regular spiral fear may give rise to balls of gray pink and yellow mist while fear combined with anger will give forth a blackish gray mist from which red electrical flashes appear to issue the auric egg these colors extend over the whole of the auric egg and may be seen by the clairvoyant to be influencing it throughout the auric egg which is formed round an individual by the atmosphere or aura emanating from him extends both above and below his body as well as sideways and is from nine to ten feet in height and five feet in diameter if the color of this auric egg be examined by a clairvoyant characteristics of the individual may be clearly defined after the necessary practice and development and the general character of the subject may be in this way discovered and interpreted the colors of various individuals of course it is necessary to make a long study of the aura and to attain a good deal of psychic development before all the details contained in this chapter can be discovered by the student in actual practice assuming however that you have progressed sufficiently in your studies to be enabled to see the aura of any individual you may proceed to examine the whole auric egg with its varied colors if you do this you will find them to be about as follows a highly developed individual will have a haze of golden light issuing from the head and extending almost to the top of the egg above this will be a faint purplish light on either side of this golden aura and issuing upwards and outwards from the shoulders will be a bluish light which merges into pink as it descends to the breast from that point to the thighs a pinkish light may be seen light in some cases darkish red in others about the knees this pink shades off into a delicate green and this green covers the feet and extends downward almost to the lower margin of the auric egg where it becomes a darkish blue with less highly developed individuals these colors will vary according to the tables given above in some cases the auric egg will be composed almost entirely of greys greens and browns primary colors and their meanings in general it may be said that yellow and any bright clear colors when seen in the aura of an individual denote strong vitality and active intellectuality lilac blue and violet have to do with spiritual characteristics they are associated with simple unselfish natures and with those having spiritual aspirations red is directly connected with passions and particularly anger blue is associated with religious feeling though with too muddy it denotes selfishness the brighter and clearer the colors the better and they should be as clear-cut as possible colors shown by spirits or seen clairvoyantly these colors are not always associated with the human aura or with any human form they are often seen by psychics who are developing themselves as cloud-like masses or shapes which form more or less distinctly in front of them and appear to take the outline of flowers flashes etc 
colours are occasionally seen in dreams, but the dream images of most people are colourless, or only light grey, like a shadow. They are in fact such stuff as dreams are made of. In general, these colours may be interpreted according to the laws given above, but the precise interpretation of these symbolic messages is a more difficult question to settle. A spirit who may be trying to communicate and to give a certain message to a medium may apply this same method of colour symbolism to convey his meaning, but this is often confusing to the psychic and difficult to interpret. We shall come to this question, however, in the next chapter, which is devoted to symbolism. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them – by Harroward Carrington Chapter Twelve – Symbolism Symbolism is one of the most important and, at the same time, one of the least understood subjects in the whole realm of psychics and spiritualism. A proper understanding of what it means, and the adequate interpretation of symbols as presented to the psychic, would prove of great value to every student, and to all those who are undertaking their own psychic development. What Symbolism Means First of all, it is necessary that you should understand exactly what symbolism means. A symbol is a sign for something else, which it expresses in a more or less partial and incomplete manner. Usually a symbol is a sign which appeals to one of the five senses, but denotes not a sensual thing, but the thought lying behind it. Thus the printed word on the page is the symbol of the author's thought, expressed in that word. The poem is the expression of the poet's mind and spirit, as set forth in the words and meter of the poem, etc. Thus, symbols are always only partial and incomplete, and represent but a small fraction of the thing they stand for, and we should always be in error if we tried to reconstruct the whole of the thing symbolized from what we perceive by means of our senses. Before we proceed to the subject of symbolism as studied in psychics and the phenomena of spiritualism, one other point should be explained. We never see an object in the physical world as it really is. Symbolized Objects We only perceive or realize through our five senses various aspects or qualities of the object. Thus, if you are looking at an orange, your sense of sight gives you the impression of a reddish-yellow sphere, rather irregular on its surface. Your sense of touch tells you that this thing is round, that it is somewhat rough and cool. Your sense of smell supplies you with the information that it has a pleasant odor unlike anything else, which is confirmed by your taste. In this particular instance, the sense of hearing does not enter into the question, as it would in many other instances. Now all these things which appeal to our senses color, odor, texture, etc., are qualities of the orange and not the orange itself. The orange is always something different from all of these, above and beyond them, and is more inclusive than any of these qualities and symbols. Thus, suppose you took away one of those symbols, its color. The orange would immediately become invisible to you, yet it would continue to exist, though we could never know of its existence. This shows us clearly that symbols are very inadequate and imperfect representations of a vaster something lying behind them, and they represent only a small fraction of the totality of the thing as it really exists. Symbolism of Spirit As applied to the spirit of man, we must begin by admitting the rather startling fact that no man has ever seen it. No man has ever seen another. All he has ever seen are the outward features, the form, the facial expressions of the other. And when our spirits hold communication with one another in this world, they do so by written symbols, by motions of the hands or head, or by means of air waves passing from the throat of one to the ear of the other. All but expressions or symbols, 
which are interpreted by us according to a certain prearranged code. If we did not have this prearranged code, it would be impossible for two intelligent beings to converse with one another, as may readily be seen when a Chinaman and an American meet for the first time, neither of them speaking the language of the other. They try as best they can to make each other understand what they are thinking about, what thoughts are in their minds, but they succeed very imperfectly, or not at all. The symbols employed are too inadequate to express their thoughts. Symbolism in Spirit Communication Now, all these difficulties we encounter when a spirit endeavors to communicate with us through a medium or directly. It can express itself, as a rule, only very imperfectly, as will be explained in a later chapter, and must resort largely to symbols to convey its meaning. Hence, we should be very mistaken if we were to interpret this symbolism literally, or to assume that it represented the whole of the subject matter which the spirit desired to convey. As I said in my book, The Problems of Psychical Research, our dreams as we know are largely symbolic, the work of Freud and others having proved this beyond all doubt. It is highly probable that the ravings of delirium are also of this nature, though no one, so far as I know, has yet devoted to their study the attention they deserve. Certainly it is true in mediumistic phenomena, for in trance conditions a large number of the messages, tests, and visions seen are of this nature and character, the symbolism being often so elaborate that the original thought is not perceived. Why this symbolism? The probable answer to this question is that the message cannot be given directly, and that this symbolic method of presentation must be resorted to in order to get the message through at all. There is good evidence to show that a pictorial method is resorted to very largely by the spirits. Mediums seeing what they describe very often when the more direct auditory method is not resorted to. The spirit presents somehow to the mind of the medium a picture, which is described and often interpreted by the medium. Often this interpretation is quite erroneous, resembling a defective analysis of a dream. Because of this, the message is not recognized, yet the source of the message may have been perfectly veridical. Truth-telling. Let me illustrate this more fully. Suppose you desire to tell a Chinaman who speaks not a word of English to fetch a certain object from the next room. It would be useless for you to say the word watch because he would not know what the word meant. Probably you would tap your waistcoat pocket, pretend to take out a watch, wind it, look at the hands, etc., in your endeavor to convey to him your meaning. If this were not recognized for any reason, you would have the utmost difficulty in conveying your meaning to him, and equal difficulty in telling him to fetch the watch from the next room. Now, supposing these antics, or somewhat similar ones, were resorted to by a spirit in his attempt to convey the word watch, perhaps to remind the sitter of a particular watch he used to wear, the spirit might well proceed as follows. He taps his stomach and looks at a spot over his left side. He seems to wish to convey the impression that he has suffered much from bowel trouble, perhaps a cancer on the left side. Yes, he seems to be taking something away from his body. Evidently they removed some growth and he wishes to convey the idea that something was taken from him. Now he is examining his hand. He is looking intently. Now he is doing something with his fingers. I can't see what it is, a little movement. Was he connected with machinery in life? Now he is pointing to the door, etc. The Interpretation of Symbols Such an interpretation of the facts, it will be observed, while describing his actions, is wholly misleading as to its interpretation. The symbolism has been wholly misconstrued, and, inasmuch as the subject probably never died of cancer, had no bowel trouble, underwent no operation, and was never connected with machinery, it is highly probable that the message would be put down wholly to the medium's subconscious imagination, or even to guessing or conscious fraud. Yet, it will be observed, the message was, in its inception, wholly veridical, the fault lying in the symbolism misinterpreted by the medium. There is evidence to show that other forms of symbolism are adopted also, 
applying to the auditory as well as to the visual presentation of images. It is well known that names are very difficult to obtain by mediums, and this is probably due to the fact that names are not pictures or visual symbols and in themselves mean nothing as a rule. They are merely a combination of letters having a certain sound. The Forms of Symbolism It is generally easier for the spirit to impress a partially developed psychic by means of a picture than in any other way, and for this reason names are difficult to get. Still, in many cases names are obtained by a picture shown. Thus, the name Merrifield was in one case given to the psychic as a picture of a number of children happily playing in a green field. Among other forms of symbolism are the following. A large key may be shown to the psychic. This may not mean a key at all, but a symbol of success, the key being the means by which the door of prosperity is opened. Colors are frequently shown, and nearly all colors are symbolic of something or other and have their definite meaning, as we saw in the last chapter. Strange, weird, and horrible figures do not necessarily mean anything bad or anything evil. They may be symbolic of something entirely different, and this is frequently seen in dreams, which are composed almost entirely of symbols throughout. Most psychics, when they are developing, see peculiar specks, clouds, and forms shaping themselves before them in space. They are naturally at a loss to interpret and explain these images. While there is much latitude of interpretation, always in symbolism the following simple suggestions based on traditional teachings may be found helpful. Clouds and Lights Clouds, if white, may be interpreted as signifying happiness and prosperity, either to the psychic or to one near and dear to them. If these seem to recede rapidly and fade away in the distance, a journey is often indicated. If the clouds appear to be advancing toward you, it indicates that news will shortly reach you. Good if the clouds are white, bad if they are dark. If red and lurid, ill fortune is upon your horizon, for which you must be on constant guard. Black clouds symbolize troubles of the heart. Tiny moving speeds of light, if they truly result from psychic development, are said to introduce that you are progressing favorably in your psychic sensitiveness. If these specks are dark, however, evil or harmful influences may be about you, for which you must be on a constant lookout. A light within a light is said to symbolize the presence of some spirit, desirous of communicating. Should such a sign appear to you, try at once to enter into communication with the spirit intelligence by asking questions, and note whether the light you see endeavors to reply to you by means of some simple code. Reptiles and other unpleasant signs usually symbolize the hidden fears of the psychic. They are symbolized in this way, externalizing the subconscious fear thought of the subject. Root out your hidden fear and apprehension, assert your mastery and fearlessness, and the unpleasant sign will always disappear. The Subconscious and Symbols the subconscious mind has the faculty of describing in symbolic form thoughts, impressions, or influences which come to it, either through the senses or more directly by telepathic or clairvoyant visions or messages which are said to be given through it by the spirits. The spirit may convey a certain message to the subconscious mind of the psychic, and the message may be externalized or presented to the ordinary conscious mind in symbolic form, representing, apparently, something entirely different from the original message. It is in the interpretation of these symbols that much of the true art of mediumship and psychic development will be found to lie. The better the medium, the more expert in the interpretation of these symbols. At present, no general rule can be laid down as to the interpretation of the symbols employed, since these will differ very largely in every case, each medium having his own method of interpretation and his own form of symbolism. You must learn for yourself, by repeated experience, what the various symbols mean to you, and thus form a code or method of interpretation, which you can always follow throughout your future development. A close study of symbolism will yield you very important practical results, 
as well as being of great interest in itself. End of chapter 12「mind reading thought reading thought transference are all terms meaning very much the same thing namely the ability to impress the mind of another person with a definite thought or thoughts without traveling through the usual avenues of sense the word telepathy was coined by mr f w h myers in 1882 and is derived from two greek words tele at a distance and pathos feeling and means literally sensing at a distance. From this it has come to mean thought reading, in general, as we now understand it. How Telepathy Operates How telepathy takes place we cannot yet say with certainty. Some scientific men, such as Sir William Crookes, are inclined to believe that vibrations in the ether travel from brain to brain, very much like the messages in wireless telegraphy. Others, on the contrary, contend that this explanation is insufficient and that we have no proof that such brain waves exist. As Mr. Myers expressed it, life has the power of manifesting itself to life, and this is as far as we can go as yet by way of scientific explanation of the facts. It is almost certainly true that telepathy takes place not between the conscious minds of two individuals, but by way of the subconscious that vast field which we described in chapter 4, the subconscious, so that if a message is sent from one conscious mind to another, it would travel in rather a roundabout fashion as follows, from the conscious to the subconscious mind of A, from that to the subconscious mind of B, and from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind of B. In B, the process by which it was conveyed from the subconscious to the ordinary mind would be that of externalization, so frequently seen in dreams, crystal gazing, and other phenomena. This fully explains to us why it is that we frequently receive telepathic messages at the moment we are falling to sleep, or at least appear to do so. We may have received the message an hour or two before this, but its externalization was impossible until the ordinary consciousness ceased to be so active with the affairs of the day and then the subconscious mind had a chance to deliver its message, received some time before from some distant mind. The Various Kinds of Telepathic Messages Telepathic messages may be visual, in which case they take the form of pictures, figures, written or printed words, etc. They may be auditory, in which case they take the form of spoken words. They may be emotional, in which case the subject may feel a particular depression or excitement. They may be volitional, in which case the subject is seized with the imperative desire to perform a certain action, etc. Telepathic messages may originate either in the living or in the dead, as they are transmitted from the subconscious mind, perhaps under the supervision and direction of the conscious mind, they are often transmitted most effectually during sleep, trance, under the influence of some drug, in delirium, at the moment of death, etc. These messages are most easily received at such times when the conscious mind is asleep or in abeyance, and for this reason we have so-called visions of the dying, ecstasy, trance-speaking, and revelation, etc. Telepathy from Spirits it is probably true that spirits converse with one another directly by means of telepathy, though they understand fully the thought of the other as though the sentence had been fully spoken. Swedenborg tells us that this is the case, and that the telepathic thoughts sent out by a spirit appear to other spirits or to mediums in trance as clear and sonorous as spoken words. 
if spirits in the flesh can converse at times with one another by means of telepathy, and if disembodied spirits converse with one another by this means, it is only natural to suppose that this is frequently the method of communication resorted to between embodied and disembodied spirits, and all transmediums know that this is in fact the case. The larger meanings and applications of telepathy will be discussed more fully in the chapter devoted to prayer, etc. Practical Experiments in Telepathy The following practical exercises will enable you to prove to your own satisfaction that telepathy exists and that it can be reduced to a more or less simple process by continued practice. Select a friend with whom you are in sympathy, physically, mentally, and morally. One of you must be the sender or transmitter, the other the receiver or recipient. Let us suppose for a moment that you are the transmitter. The recipient should be seated in a comfortable chair at one end of a fairly large room, which must be freely ventilated. It is best that, at least during the early experiments, he should be blindfolded, or that he close his eyes or sit with his back to you, pencil in hand and pad on knee. He should sit in a semi-darkened part of the room. For your part, you should sit at a table, facing him, that is his back, with a pad of paper and pencil before you. Have a bright light thrown on the pad of paper, leaving the rest of the room in semi-darkness. Now draw upon the paper a symbol, perhaps a geometric figure, such as a triangle, circle, square, etc. Look at this figure intently, and endeavor to impress it on the recipient. You should not make each trial exceed one minute in length. How to Ensure Success the attitude of mind which you hold during these experiments is very important. You should will that your recipient should see the picture presented to him, yet you should not strain yourself in the attempt, and wrinkling your brows, tensing the muscles, etc., will not add to the certainty with which your picture is conveyed, rather the reverse. On the other hand, you should have complete confidence in the fact that he will get the impression you are sending him. Never allow yourself for a moment to believe that you will fail. Say to yourself that he has already succeeded in receiving it. Do not allow yourself to become flustered or worried or anxious. Imagine your thoughts traveling to him in a definite form, either in the shape of the object itself or in the word, square, circle, etc., though in that case you must be careful that you do not unconsciously whisper the word so that he hears it. The recipient on his part should make his mind as blank as possible and note down any pictures or impressions that come to him, no matter how wild they may appear. Above all, you must not be discouraged by early non-successes, for these you must expect. More Complicated Experiments after you have succeeded with the diagrams, you may try more complicated pictures, such as playing cards, which are very good for this purpose, as the deck may be shuffled between each draw, and it is easy to calculate the percentage of guesses, since chance would always be 51 to 1 against the subject hitting upon the correct card by accident. After these experiments, you may try some in the transference of pain. Prick yourself lightly in various parts of the body with a sharp needle, or pinch yourself and see whether the subject can locate the pain correctly on himself. If he is a good subject, he will do so in very many instances, as though the pain were transferred directly to him and you were pricking or pinching him. Next you may try a number of experiments in smell and taste. Procure a number of substances such as cloves, nutmeg, pepper, sugar, etc., and smell or taste these in turn, being careful that you are far enough removed from your subject to prevent him from smelling these in the usual way. Many good subjects can tell immediately the substance you are putting into your mouth the instant you placed it there. After you have succeeded this far, you should try to increase the distance between you until you can perform the same feats though miles apart. How to prevent evil influences from affecting you. These simple experiments will prove to you and to the skeptic the existence of telepathy. They will render you more sensitive to the reception of messages from distant living minds, and also messages from the discarnate, 
In this way you will cultivate your sensitiveness to messages of this character, and this will be beneficial to you, provided that you do not carry these practices too far and cultivate your sensitiveness unduly in wrong directions. Under normal, healthy conditions, your mind will not be affected by impressions of this character, since it will be most difficult for you to receive them, as a rule, no matter how hard you may try. The mind always protects itself against too easy access by outside minds. It is very rare indeed that subjects are impressed against their will. Some persons, it is true, believe that others at a distance are influencing them in this manner, and impressing them to do certain things. Many believe that they are hypnotized, etc. But in nearly all cases, these beliefs are illusory. They have no foundation in fact. When examined, they are found to rest wholly in the imagination of the subject, and they are frequently but the indications of an unbalanced mind. This does not mean that such persons are necessarily insane, but they would become so were they to dwell upon their imagined grievance long enough, and believe in it after they have been shown repeatedly that such was not the true case. It is this persistent will to believe in a thing which is not true that is one of the causes of insanity. The student who practices telepathy within reason, and who has followed the instructions contained in the early chapters of this book as regards fortifying and protecting his own inner nature, need have no fear that telepathic influences or impressions from others will ever affect him against his own will. In nearly all cases, these so-called influences are imaginary. And even should they exist, the subject who has mustered himself and who has strengthened his soul from within is capable of overcoming and repulsing any outside forces of this character, and of preventing any telepathic influence ever reaching him, no matter whether it comes from the living or from the dead. End of chapter 13. Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado. Chapter 14 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeannie Hall. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harewood Carrington. Chapter 14 Clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is derived from two French words and means literally clear seeing. It means far more, however, in the language of spiritualism and psychics, and is now used to cover and classify, if not to explain, a large number of different phenomena, which some day will probably be explained in other ways. There are various types and kinds of clairvoyance, different authorities having given somewhat different definitions of the various subdivisions. Thus, the Manual of the National Spiritualists Association subdivides and defines the various types of clairvoyance as follows. Subjective Clairvoyance 1. Subjective clairvoyance is that psychic condition of a human being, who thereby becomes a medium, which enables spirit intelligences, through the manipulation of the nerve centers of sight, to impress or photograph upon the brain of the medium pictures and images which are seen as visions by the medium without the aid of the physical eye. These pictures and images may be of things, spiritual or material, past or present, remote or near, hidden or uncovered, or they may have their existence simply in the conception or imagination of the medium communicating them. Objective Clairvoyance 2. Objective clairvoyance is that psychic power or function of seeing objectively spiritual beings, objects, and things by and through the spiritual sensorium which pervades the physical mechanism of vision, without which objective clairvoyance would be impossible. But few persons are born with this power. In some it is developed, and in others it has but a casual quickening. Its extent is governed by the rate of vibration under which it operates. Thus, one clairvoyant may see objectively spiritual things which to another may be invisible, because of the degree of difference in the intensity of the power. X-ray clairvoyance 3. 
X-ray clairvoyance is a form of clairvoyance which partakes of the characteristics of the X-ray and seems to be objective. The clairvoyant who possesses this power is able to see physical objects through intervening physical matter, can perceive the internal parts of the human body, diagnose disease, and observe the operations of healing and decay. Cataleptic Clairvoyance 4. Cataleptic clairvoyance occurs when the body is in a trance state resembling sleep, induced by hypnotic power, exercised by an incarnate or decarnate spirit, or it may be self-induced. When in this state the spirit leaves the body and is able, at its own will or the suggestion of the hypnotist, to travel to remote places and to see clearly what is transpiring in the places it visits, and to observe spiritual as well as material things in its environment. While in this state it sometimes happens that the thoughts of the spirit in its travels are expressed by the lips of the physical body, and that thought images are conveyed to it through the physical body. This is due to the fact that there is a spirit cord which connects the body and the spirit and transmits vibrations between them. As long as this cord is not severed, the spirit can return to the body. But should it be severed, then what we call death will at once ensue. Under this form of clairvoyance, there is an interblending of subjective and objective spiritual sight. Trans-Control Clairvoyance 5. Trans-Control Clairvoyance is that psychic state under which the control of the physical body of the medium is assumed by a spirit intelligence, and the consciousness of the medium is, for the time being, dethroned. In this case, the controlling spirit is really the clairvoyant, and simply uses the medium's body as a means of communicating what the spirit sees, and therefore the question of subjective and objective spiritual sight, insofar as the medium is concerned, cannot be raised. To some persons who go to mediums for readings and who may become witnesses in trials at law, it may not be known that under trance control the medium is to all intents and purposes absent. Therefore, in dealing with definitions of clairvoyance to be used for the enlightenment of thinking people, judges, and juries, it seems necessary for the protection of such mediums to explain what is here termed trans-control clairvoyance. Telepathic clairvoyance, etc. 6. Telepathic clairvoyance is the subjective perception in picture form of thought transmitted from a distance. The type of clairvoyance illustrated in Class Four is frequently called traveling clairvoyance, because the spirit appears to travel, after leaving its body, and visit distant scenes. According to the above definitions, this type of clairvoyance is classified under definition number one, but other authorities would give it a separate class by itself. When the psychic's mind seems to travel backward along the stream of time, and remembers events which were beyond its normal recollection, we have cases of so-called retrocognition. When, on the other hand, the psychic's mind seems to travel forward into the future, and sees scenes and events which, of course, he was otherwise unable to foretell, we have cases of prevision, prophecy, and precognition. This latter subject will be dealt with more fully in the chapter devoted to Prophecy versus Fortune-Telling. We also have spontaneous and experimental clairvoyance, these definitions explaining themselves. Then, direct and indirect clairvoyance. Direct, when no other mind or agency is involved but the psychic's own. Indirect, when it goes through a roundabout channel and involves some other mind, incarnate or discarnate. As opposed to telepathic clairvoyance, we have so-called independent clairvoyance. Also, there are cases of reciprocal clairvoyance, in which two persons see one another at the same time and, as it were, exchange their clairvoyant visions. The type of clairvoyance which is characterized by leaving the body and visiting the spiritual spheres, afterwards returning to reanimate the body, is called ecstasy. Mr. Ledbetter divides clairvoyance into three subdivisions, clairvoyance in time, clairvoyance in space, and direct clairvoyance, in which the astral or spiritual senses are opened up so as to perceive planes of activity now about us. Dream Clairvoyance Clairvoyance may also occur in dreams, crystal visions, etc., and clairaudience, which corresponds to clairvoyance save that the information is obtained by means of the ear rather than the eye, may be obtained through shell-hearing. 
In this case, the messages are heard rather than seen. Another technical name for clairvoyance, which is sometimes used, is telesthesia. Clairvoyance may manifest itself in a variety of forms, as the above definitions would signify. The most common form is spontaneous clairvoyance, in which the psychic sees pictures of absent persons and scenes. Clairvoyant dreams are fairly common. Clairvoyant Diagnosis There is a type of mental clairvoyance which enables the subject to see, as it were, into the body of another, diagnosing his disease as though he perceived clearly the conditions present in that individual's body at the time. This form of psychic vision was possessed by Andrew Jackson Davis in a remarkable degree, but is possessed by many psychics of our own day. Another form of clairvoyance is that in which underground metals and waters may sometimes be perceived. Usually in this case, the psychic walks over the ground to be explored with a forked twig or stick in his hands. Suddenly this bends or dips, and where this happens, water or metal is to be found. This is technically known as dowsing, and has been proved to exist as a scientific fact by Sir William F. Barrett, Professor of Physics in the University of Dublin. Of late years, a new and peculiar type of clairvoyance has been developed by Mr. Vincent N. Turvey of London, a friend of Mr. W. T. Stead. He termed this phone voyance, for the reason that he receives his impressions and intuitions, etc., when he is conversing with a distant friend over the telephone, and then only. This is a form of sensitiveness which could be obtained by many psychics if they developed it. The Explanation of Clairvoyance Clairvoyance has been explained in a variety of ways. We may briefly summarize these theories as follows. 1. The astral or spiritual sense theory. This may be stated as follows. Corresponding to each physical sense organ, the eye, ear, etc., there is a corresponding spiritual or astral sense organ. We see physical objects by means of the physical eye and hear them by means of the physical ear. When we see clairvoyantly, on the contrary, we see by means of our spiritual eye, and when we hear clairaudiently, we hear by means of the spiritual or astral ear. These spiritual sense organs function in a spiritual world, and of course serve the spiritual body when we die, as our physical organs now serve us, and operate on the spirit plane of activity. If their use is not cultivated in precisely the right direction, it may lead to difficulties for the reason that both the astral and spiritual sight may be used at the same time. They may become mixed up, and you may see two worlds at once instead of one, so that you cannot be sure when you go outside the door whether you are going to step on the pavement or into a great ditch, both of which you see equally clearly before you. Many persons have got into this condition, which takes some time to outgrow. 2. The Spiritual Influence Theory According to this theory, clairvoyance is accomplished not by means of the subject's own unaided powers, but always through the instrumentality of a spirit who sees the distant scenes, etc., and impresses them upon the subject's mind telepathically. Tubes, Thought Forms, and Direct Perception 3. The Astral Tube Theory According to this view, the clairvoyant constructs a sort of telescope or tube for himself out of astral matter, and through this he looks. The figures, in this case, always appear small and far off. 4. By the Creation of a Thought Form On this theory, we create a thought form for ourselves in a locality we desire to visit and utilize it for the purpose of observation. We look out of its eyes, hear with its ears, etc. 5. The Direct Perception Theory This theory says that outside influences play no part in the phenomena, but that we perceive distant scenes ourselves by means of some process of self-projection. But here we are met with a difficulty that, if the psychic is absent, viewing the distant scene, how can he also be present in the room, animating his own body, and speaking through it, as he undoubtedly does in many cases? Most psychics, when they begin their development, see shapes and figures more frequently than they experience any other phenomena. They wonder why this should be. Why should nearly all of us see? Now and then, it is true, we come across one who hears more easily than sees, but he is the exception, not the rule. Why and how we see in clairvoyance. 
The explanation of this fact is probably the following. We use our eyes more than we do any other one of our senses. We feel that our active consciousness is more connected with sight than with anything else. The sight centers in the brain are more used than any of the others, and this fact is proved by dreams, in which we see figures but very seldom hear spoken words. Again, our memory consists mostly of visual symbols. If we think of a person, we call up his image before us, this being a memory image. Now, as these parts of the mind and brain are so active, it is only an extension of this faculty of inducing memory images which enables us to see objects and figures in clairvoyance. We only have to force this faculty of the mind a little more than usual to carry it beyond the limitations of physical sense whereas with the other senses much less used we have to do a great deal more of this cultivating or forcing process in order to develop the corresponding spiritual organs clairvoyance and similar faculties depend in many cases upon the partial liberation or freeing of the spirit from the body and the stimulation of the corresponding psychic sense organs into a higher degree of activity and so permitting their use the following are a few exercises which will be found helpful in developing this faculty of clairvoyance according to our methods of development. Developing Exercises 1. Seat yourself in a comfortable chair in a semi-darkened room. Mentally construct, i.e. imagine, before you a tube, open at both ends. One end of this tube fits over your eyes, and the other end extends indefinitely outward into space. Imagine that this tube is hollow, and that you can see through it perfectly. Turn this tube in the direction of the house of a friend of yours. Mentally go into a room, and see if you can discover in it anyone present, and if so, who he is and what he looks like. Note what you see carefully. You will be able to verify the next day how far your vision is correct. 2. Construct the tube as before. At the other end of this tube, which you should imagine about one hundred yards long. You must endeavor to see clairvoyantly the face of a friend. Try to distinguish the features of this face, making them clearer and clearer. When you have done this, gradually pull it toward you by an effort of will, until it is only about two or three feet distant. It should then be perfectly clear and every feature distinguishable. When you have succeeded in visualizing this face so clearly that you see it as distinctly as you would if that individual stood before you in life, your progress as a clairvoyant will have made great advances, and you may then begin experiments in influencing this person at a distance, while seeing his face before you as explained. Will that he should do a certain thing, to think of you at a certain time, or see your face float before him as he is busy with his daily occupations. If you practice this persistently, you will ultimately achieve success, being able to influence persons without doubt. Polarization and how to use it. This ability to influence a distant person or object by means of your will, when directed toward him, has been termed a polarization, because you polarize a path or channel through the astral atmosphere toward the desired point, and this channel facilitates psychic communication in both directions. A great deal depends, during these experiments, upon your ability to hold the object clearly in your mind's eye and to concentrate upon it. If you do not do this, your efforts will be lost, since you will find there are a great many astral currents playing to and fro, which tend to disintegrate your own currents set up by you, and unless these are strong, you will not succeed in overcoming the astral cross-currents. In conducting these experiments, you must be sure, especially at first, always to keep your consciousness centered in your own body, and not to let it go outward into space along with your thought. Your will alone must travel outward. You must keep your consciousness within your own physical body. If you do not do this, you will be apt to get into trouble. Your starting point, your focal center, as it is called, must always be maintained. In developing clairvoyance, you should remember that faith and belief tend to open up your latent powers and faculties, while disbelief has the contrary effect of closing them and shutting off all further development. This is true in all lines of psychic unfoldment. 
Clairvoyance is a faculty possessed by the whole human race in varying degrees, and there are indications that with each generation its power is becoming greater and greater, so that the time will doubtless come when every one will see clairvoyantly, just as we now see with our ordinary eyes. In fact, the possession of strong intuition and sentiments, sensing the feelings and emotions of others, etc., are but undeveloped clairvoyant flashes, giving you an insight into the mind of the person with whom you are conversing. Factors in the Development of Clairvoyance Concentration is an important factor in the cultivation of clairvoyance. You must train your mind so that you can think of a particular object for several minutes without relaxing or allowing any other thought to enter your consciousness. You must practice gazing at an object until you can do this for two or three minutes, without moving your eyes and without fatigue. You should cultivate deep breathing exercises and, during inspiration, think that you are drawing on the vital energy of the universe, while with each breath you exhale you are throwing off any adverse influences which may have come to you. Visualizing is an important factor in developing clairvoyance. You should get into the habit of calling up before your mind a face you have seen or a scene you have witnessed that day, trying to remember every detail and making it clearer and clearer until you have every detail clear in your mind's eye. You should then endeavor to project it outward into space, as though you were seeing these pictures outside your head as real entities, and not merely as memory pictures. Crystal gazing, etc., will greatly help in this. How to Distinguish True from False One question which always presents itself to the mind of the student is this. How can I distinguish the true from the false, real clairvoyant visions from memory pictures and hallucinations? It is extremely difficult to do this, particularly for the beginner, and this ability to distinguish comes only with prolonged practice and experience. A lady of my acquaintance has all her life been enabled to distinguish between phantasmal figures of the living and those of the dead. That is, she could tell by looking at the figure whether it represented a living or a dead person. Again, she was always able to tell whether this was a genuine or helpful intelligence, or whether it was an evil or lying one. This ability to distinguish cannot be gained in a day. It must come by practice, and the beginnings of genuine clairvoyance can only be ascertained by experiment and by following up on the visions and figures which appear to one, and see whether they lead to anything definite in the way of progress and enlightenment or not. As to the various symbols and colors which appear to the clairvoyant, these should be interpreted according to the rules laid down in chapters 11 and 12, devoted to these subjects. Clairvoyance and dreams will be discussed in the next chapter. A few words in conclusion as to the theory of clairvoyance. It will be remembered that I enumerated before, pages 117 to 124, the various theories which have been advanced to explain clairvoyance, the astral sense theory, the direct vision theory, etc. Our own view of the matter is that all of the explanations previously proposed are in a sense true, that is, they are all true in particular cases, but that none of them explains all types of clairvoyance. The spirit influence theory is true in some instances, the direct clairvoyance theory is true in others, and the astral sense theory is the correct one in still others, etc. The Mystery Solved As to the difficulty which is presented by the fact that a clairvoyant can animate and speak through his own body while he is psychically active elsewhere, this is explained by assuming that only a portion of his total psychic self remains behind, and that the more active spirit part performs the journey or excursion this part being connected to the physical body by means of a cord or connection which unites it to the latter. This connection is sometimes called the silver thread, and is the channel of communication between the spirit and its body, while the former has gone on its excursion. If this thread were to snap or become broken, death would take place, since the spirit would be unable to return and reanimate the body. Such accidents are extremely rare, but they have been recorded from time to time in the past. In clairvoyance, the connection remains, of course, intact, and communication back and forth between the body and the absent psychic self takes place along this cord or thread. 
in still other types of clairvoyance on the other hand no actual excursion or leaving the body takes place the active consciousness remains in the body animating it while the clairvoyant vision takes place through the psychic telescope or tube before mentioned in such cases there is no difficulty in accounting for all we see but this is not such an advanced type of clairvoyance as the former in which the psychic self leaves the body and goes on trips and excursions of its own end of chapter fourteen Recording by Jeanie Hall, Eldersburg, Maryland. Chapter 15 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. By Hereward Carrington. Dreams. Dreams usually take place during sleep, though there is a peculiar form of imaginative picturing which may occur sometimes during the waking hours, and which we call daydreaming. Of these I shall treat in another place. Speaking first of ordinary dreams, I may begin by pointing out that before we can understand them, we must know a little of the nature and phenomena of sleep in which they occur. We all spend about one-third of our lives in sleep, so that this is a condition which we should certainly know something about if we possibly can. What is sleep? Various theories have been advanced in the past to explain sleep, but no satisfactory theory has ever been fully accepted. Thus we have the so-called chemical theories, which endeavor to account for sleep by assuming that certain poisonous substances are formed in the body during waking hours and are eliminated during sleep others have suggested that sleep is due to peculiar conditions of the circulation of blood in the brain still others that the action of certain glands explains sleep others that muscular relaxation accounts for it others that the lack of external stimuli is sufficient to induce profound slumber all of these theories have been shown insufficient to explain the facts we shall never arrive at a satisfactory theory of sleep doubtless until we admit the presence of a vital force and the existence of an individual human spirit which withdraws more or less completely from the body during the hours of sleep and derives spiritual invigoration and nourishment during its sojourn in the spiritual world we shall speak of this more fully presently the seven common dreams for the present we must explain to begin with the common types of dreams and show how they are to be accounted for there are seven types of dreams which it is said everybody experiences at one time or another in his life these are one the falling dream two the flying dream three the dream of inadequate clothing four the dream of not being able to get away from some beast or injurious person or thing that is pursuing five the dream of being drawn irresistibly to some dangerous place six the dream that some darling wish has been gratified seven the dream of being about to go on a journey and being unable to get your things into your trunk etc some of these dreams are to be explained in one way some in another but broadly speaking it may be said that all ordinary dreams such as the above or others of a like type are due to one of three causes one physical stimuli two subconscious mental association three subconscious imagination in addition to this subconscious field there is also another the superconscious of which we shall speak later but as this is not recognized by orthodox psychologists of today we shall not discuss it for the present causes of dreams physical stimuli give rise to dreams in this way the dream of inadequate clothing for example is doubtless produced by chilling the surface of the body this in turn usually being due to the bedclothes falling off onto the floor the dream of falling is probably due to the fact that by lying too long in one position the blood supply is cut off 
causing loss of sensation in the under part of the body this in turn giving rise to the idea that we are not supported consequently that we are flying or falling etc if a book is dropped this may be symbolized as the report of a pistol in a duel etc association causes many dreams in the following way one idea or object of the mind brings up another connected with it more or less directly as it would be in life and the whole storehouse of the subconscious mind is drawn upon in these associations so that dreams are far more varied than our conscious associations in addition to this the third factor namely imagination is greatly enlarged and given free play for the reason that the conscious logical mind is dormant to a great extent and hence the wild flights of imagination which we take in sleep are possible the interpretation of dreams it is because of these facts that nothing appears absurd to us while we are dreaming no matter how ridiculous the situation may be it never seems so to us until we are awake and able to reason over it the curious medley of thoughts composing most dreams presents a striking resemblance to the ravings of delirium and insanity and various medical authors have written books aiming to show the close similarity between dreams and such insane wanderings it has been shown of late years that almost all dreams however illogical they may appear are in reality more or less consistent and that a logical strain or undercurrent may be found running through them if they are analyzed and examined carefully enough the celebrated dr freud of vienna has worked out an elaborate system of dream interpretation based on his exploration of the subconscious mind and those who may be interested may consult his recent work on dreams he traces most dreams to early childhood impressions and believes that they express as a rule suppressed wishes which have slumbered in the subconscious mind of the dreamer and are externalized in this form dreams have in fact been compared to the bubbles which break upon the surface of a pond of water in both cases they have risen upwards through the lower strata and we see the finished product only what gave rise to this this is a subject for further investigation how to analyze dreams if you wish to ascertain the causes of certain dreams you may often do so in the following manner place your subject who wishes his dream analyzed in a comfortable chair seated in a quiet room in semi-darkness set going a metronome or ask him to listen to the tick of a large clock while doing this certain images and impressions will arise before his mind ask him to tell you what these are as soon as he has done so question him as to the origin of these etc and by continued questioning going deeper all the time into his mind you will ultimately find out the origin of his dream an example will prove this a lady of our acquaintance went into hysterics every time she smelled plum pudding she could not account for this one night she had a dream in which she saw herself cooking pudding in the kitchen and woke up in a great state of fear and excitement analysis of this dream showed that when she was a little girl she had been left alone in the kitchen while pudding was cooking and that the pudding had burnt and nearly set the house on fire she saw herself running from the kitchen and screaming as soon as this was discovered she no longer experienced any fear or unpleasant sensations while smelling any kind of pudding she was in fact completely cured the subconscious fear had been removed and its evil effects ceased many similar fears which terrorize our dreams and cause nightmare could be shown to be due to these early childish impressions were we to analyze carefully enough such dreams the symbolism of dreams the main characteristic of nearly all dreams is their symbolism of all our experiences dreams are doubtless the most symbolic they represent certain wishes desires emotions thoughts etc which fill the subconscious mind and which become associated together forming what are known as complexes these thoughts as they become externalized are presented in symbolic form thus a snake may be a symbol of fear and hatred an angel may be a symbol of love 
a key may be a symbol of success etc seeing and hearing dreams few people see colors in dreams the shadows and figures which make up nearly all dream images are colorless or are of the consistence of light smoke just why this should be so we do not exactly know but some artists who deal a great deal in color experience dreams in which all the characters are clothed in gorgeous and highly colored robes this however is the exception not the rule again why do we all see figures scenes etc in our dreams we very seldom hear either music or spoken conversation words are more rare than pictures the reason for this is probably that we use our eyes more continually and more consciously than we do our ears and for this reason the visual images are more easily expressed than the auditory symbols smell taste and touch are even more rare factors in dreams than hearing many persons experience peculiar visions while falling to sleep they see hundreds of tiny faces before them in the dark which may condense into one and this becomes larger and larger and finally vanishes etc these are well understood and need cause no fear or anxiety persistent dream images on the other hand dream pictures or images may continue for some moments after awakening and these are called persistent dream images thus dr abercrombie mentions an instance of a medical friend of his who having sat up late one evening fell asleep in his chair and had a frightful dream in which the prominent figure was an immense baboon he awoke with the fright got up instantly and walked to a table which was in the middle of the room he was then awake and quite conscious of the articles around him but close to the wall of the apartment he distinctly saw the baboon making the same grimaces which he had seen in his dream and the picture continued visible for about half a minute this is a good case of persistent dream image what is somnambulism occasionally the muscular system becomes active during sleep instead of the senses only and then we have cases of somnambulism in which the patient walks and talks in his sleep etc and even does consecutive mental work this shows a too active condition of his subconscious mind which should be checked by proper treatment it is extremely dangerous to wake anyone suddenly in the middle of an access of somnambulism if the patient talks in his sleep it may be very interesting at times to converse with him in a low tone and see whether or not he will reply intelligently many cases are on record in which valuable information has been obtained in this way not only about the subject but about distant scenes and even about his spirit friends it is possible also to cultivate automatic writing with a good somnambulist and in one case known to us the patient went to bed with a planchette board tied to her hand the pencil resting on a large sheet of paper and when she awoke in the morning it was covered with interesting messages this is an experiment which the enthusiastic student would do well to repeat i must now speak of superconscious dreams in which we are brought into contact with a higher plane of life and activity in the same way that we are in contact with a lower plane during many of our ordinary dreams when this happens we experience so-called supernormal dreams of which the following are types supernormal dreams one the telepathic dream in which telepathy occurs during sleep between a distant living mind and the sleeping mind of the subject information is thereby imparted which the sleeper could not possibly have known for instance in one case the sleeper's brother appeared to him and notified him of his own recent accident which proved to be true in another case the sleeper dreamed that a friend of his told him something which also proved to be true etc these are so-called telepathic dreams Two clairvoyant dreams in which the subject sees distant scenes and his vision subsequently proves to be true in such cases the dreamer apparently leaves his body and travels to the locality in question three premonitory dreams in which a vision of the future is obtained 
in a few days weeks or months as the case may be this dream vision is fulfilled to the letter four spirit communication during dreams in which a discarnate spirit apparently appears and gives a message to the sleeper either of consolation or perhaps tells him an important item of news which he should know in cases of this character we border very closely upon the medium trance and true mediumship in rare cases communication has apparently been established in this manner experimentally induced dreams it is possible to induce telepathic dreams experimentally in another and you will find it most interesting to endeavor to do this or to serve as the subject for others who endeavor to induce certain dreams in you during your sleeping hours in such cases the sleeper has only to describe as carefully as possible his dreams on awakening those who endeavor to impress the dreams upon him must picture in their minds a clearly formed series of images allowing these to float before them in space endeavoring to impress each one in turn upon the sleeper by the power of will after a little practice these experiments will often be found to succeed it is possible to control our own dreams to a certain extent if we desire to do so thus on falling to sleep you may will that you experience dreams of a certain character and if you set about it rightly you can obtain these in many instances help is frequently given in this way i know of several cases in which a subject has fallen to sleep after mentally suggesting to herself that she would receive enlightenment help and counsel through her dreams concerning the difficult problems of her daily life in practically every case this was given though often in somewhat symbolic form if this were cultivated it would prove a useful adjunct to our daily lives remembering dreams another good experiment which the interested pupil should make would be to endeavor to catch himself falling asleep that is to analyze the gradual loss of consciousness in his own person which occurs as he is falling into sleep some people can catch themselves in this way and others cannot those who are wide awake one minute and asleep the next will probably never make first-class mediums those who linger in the borderland the longest are those who are naturally most psychic another test is that of remembering dreams if you can remember clearly a large percentage of your dreams you are probably quite psychic on the other hand if you remember nothing that has occurred during sleep you are more or less matter-of-fact and unless you are the exception probably will not attain any very great development along psychic lines it is unwise however to cultivate to too great an extent this habit of remembering your dreams if you do you will thin the wall which separates your dream life from your waking life and if this becomes perforated trouble may result keep the two distinct therefore after your first initial experiments at introspection and dream analysis end of chapter fifteen dreams recording by pamela Krantz. Chapter 16 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 16 Automatic Writing. Automatic writing means writing which is performed without the use of the conscious mind, that is, writing which is performed by the unconscious muscular energies of the hand and arm, hence automatic or non-conscious writing. A pencil is taken in the ordinary way and held over a piece of paper, and in a short time it will be noticed that slight movements of the pencil occur, making scrawling marks on the paper. As time goes on, these marks become more and more consistent and consecutive. They begin to form circles, hooks, etc., until letters, then words, and finally whole sentences are written out. How to Obtain Automatic Writing The best way to obtain automatic writing is to hold the arm clear of the table, that is, so that neither the wrist, nor the elbows, nor any part of the arm, touches it. 
in this way a certain amount of fatigue is soon induced in the arm and as soon as this occurs automatic writing tends to begin in obtaining writing of this character you must be careful to abstract your conscious guidance from the hand as much as possible leaving it to itself do not try and write anything of your own volition let it guide itself even if it writes nonsense at first some persons obtain writing more easily if the pencil be placed between the first and second fingers but whatever way is most convenient to you should be adopted in cultivating automatic writing make the mind as blank as possible after a time you may be able to think of other things at the same time carry on a train of conversation read a book etc at the same time that your hand is writing the messages but it is improbable that you will be able to do this at first the chief thing is to make the mind blank and await results two important rules to follow when developing automatic writing you should sit for not longer than fifteen or twenty minutes daily and if possible always at the same time it is very important that these two rules be observed for two reasons in the first place your spirit friends who are we are told trying to help you in your writing would come to assist you at certain stated times more easily than irregularly especially if you told them exactly at what time to come it is a good plan to say aloud just when you have finished the writing good-bye tomorrow at the same time we will sit again for the messages in the second place the time should be limited when you obtain writing of this character you are apt to get so interested in the results when once messages begin to come and so curious in seeing what your hand says that you will lose all account of time and if you have nothing urgent to do are liable to run on hour after hour writing automatically and replying to the messages you receive if you do this for any length of time you will break down the wall of defense which normally exists against outside influences and of the importance of which i have spoken so often in the preceding chapters mr w t stead the well-known journalist and spiritualist once stated that he considered these two warnings of the utmost importance and attributed his own success and the fact that he had never encountered any difficulties or any trouble in his automatic writing to the fact that he had heeded strictly this advice how automatic writing is accomplished automatic writing is doubtless performed by the subconscious muscular action on the part of the hand and arm of the writer that is in the majority of cases but this does not serve to explain it as many people believe granting that the actual writing is obtained in this way the question remains how about the information which is often obtained by means of the writing information which the writer could not possibly have known by any normal means for instance suppose you are sitting at your table pencil in hand waiting to see what is written your hand writes i am james valentine i was killed in a railroad accident this afternoon at four o'clock granting that your own hand actually moved the pencil to write this message where did this piece of information come from how did your mind know what to write and the fact that james valentine had been killed that is the question which remains to be solved and is the one which the majority of scientists who have undertaken to investigate and explain these phenomena slur over and leave altogether unexplained in many other cases also the power seems to be greater than the medium alone could have produced and in such cases an outside power was doubtless employed as in many physical phenomena the character of the messages received many of the messages you receive especially at first will doubtless prove incoherent and disconnected like dreams in fact they are dreams only instead of seeing these thoughts and visions they are written out by your own hand in both cases however it is your dream consciousness subconsciousness which originates the message or the visions in many cases however clear and consistent messages are written and these may be supernormal and show evidence of telepathy clairvoyance premonition or spirit communication just as dreams do many mediums obtain their messages direct by automatic writing mrs piper of boston in many ways the most famous medium in the history of psychics obtained nearly all her communications in this manner in her case she passes into very deep trance while writing and has to be supported by cushions in your own case it is improbable that you will go into trance at first though you may have a tendency to do so and if you begin to feel sleepy or drowsy during the writing you should give way to this and allow yourself to pass into the trance condition in this state many of the best messages are obtained it is advisable however to do this for the first few times only in the presence of an experienced medium or psychic 
who can attend to you during the period of trance, and who will ask questions for your hand to reply to, etc. Phenomena which may occur during the writing. This feeling of drowsiness appears very often in automatic writing, but it is not universal. Many mediums who obtain remarkable messages in this manner have never passed into trance, and have no desire to do so. They remain perfectly normal throughout. It may be that when you begin to write, your hand and arm will show signs of insensibility, that is, it will lose its sensation and any feeling of pain, etc. It becomes, as we say, anesthetic. You may be quite unconscious of this fact, and only discover it by accident. A good plan is to have a friend test it for you. When you are obtaining automatic writing, close your eyes and turn your head away. Then ask your friend to prick you very lightly with a needle in various parts of your hands and arms, and see whether you experience any pain. It is quite possible that you will not do so, even if the pricks are severe. It is curious to note, however, that these pricks are noticed by the subconscious mind, for it often happens that the hand will write automatically, you are hurting me, or you pricked me in the third finger joint, or something of the kind, while you yourself might remain totally ignorant of the fact, so far as any consciousness of it was concerned. It is important for you to remember that automatic messages, like all messages of a like character, must be judged and accepted for what they are worth. More Phenomena Some of these messages are very remarkable, and contain sound advice which can be followed with profit. Some apparently originate from those spirit friends who claim to give them. On the other hand, many of them are foolish, lying, or merely silly, so that here, as in all other cases, discrimination must be used, and you must exert your own common sense and judgment in the matter of accepting these messages, and you must see to what extent you may be willing to abide and profit by the advice given. It sometimes happens that automatic writing forms letters, but these appear curiously shaped, and the words cannot be read. Sometimes it begins at the right-hand side of the page, and writes toward the left, like Hebrew. When this is the case, it is always a good plan to hold the sheet of paper up to a mirror to see whether the writing can be read in this way. If so, the writing has been merely reversed, and is what we term mirror writing. Some persons can write with the left hand as well as with the right, but usually this is not the case, except with left-handed persons. The reason seems to be that the left hand is poorly developed as a writing machine. For this reason, we can hardly expect any intelligence who may desire to give messages to find this an easy way of expressing them. Still, it may be tried after writing has been obtained by the right hand. Occasionally messages are given in foreign languages, or in queer tongues, unknown to the sitter. These may be genuine messages, and if they come in a language unknown to you, you may be more or less assured that they emanate from some spirit friend who speaks the language in question. Occasionally, however, your hand will write gibberish, and there are many cases on record where this has been done and no true language has been written. How to Develop the Power it is a good plan to sit in a semi-darkened room while obtaining automatic writing, in a comfortable position, and with the mind as free from care and preoccupation as possible. Automatic writing may, however, be obtained in a light room, if desired. Telepathic experiments may be tried in this manner. A friend of yours may try to impress upon you certain words, cards, figures, etc., which your hand writes automatically. The writing, you must remember, is only another method for the subconscious to express itself to the conscious mind and happens to be a motor channel rather than a sensory channel. If it were the latter, you would see or hear the message instead of writing it. In both cases, however, the phenomena represent mere emergence. It is not necessary to write automatically with a pencil, for a planchette board, Ouija board, or some other apparatus may be used for this purpose. Indeed, this is a much simpler method to begin with, and writing is obtained more easily than by the pencil alone. Most people find it more satisfactory, however, to discard these instruments later on and employ the pencil direct. The above rules should enable the student to obtain automatic writing in a comparatively short time. Patience is required here as elsewhere. Hold the mind in a receptive attitude, send out a mental call for guidance and wisdom, and do not come to the conclusion too quickly that the messages you receive are nonsense. Often a jumble of letters that, at first sight, mean nothing, may form a very significant message when rightly interpreted. End of chapter 16. Recording by Amanda Friday. Chapter 17 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington. Chapter 17 Crystal Gazing and Shell Hearing crystal gazing means simply the practice of looking into a ball of crystal glass or some similar substance and endeavoring to see within it pictures or images which apparently present themselves to the eye while thus gazing at it crystal gazing is very ancient the egyptians used it in their practices of divination and throughout ancient history we find traces of this magical art in the middle ages it was revived especially by the learned dr d who lived in the reign of queen elizabeth in england and who employed a seer or scryer by the name of kelly dr d wrote a book on his researches which work is now classical in more recent times crystal gazing has been made a subject of special study by the psychical research society and several books may now be had upon the question it is a very simple and at the same time one of the safest means of psychic development it is not necessary as a matter of fact to employ a crystal or even a glass ball particularly if you are a good subject but it would greatly help matters if you did possess one and we should advise the student to procure one if possible and use this for purposes of experimentation how to begin the best way to begin is to procure a crystal of at least three inches in diameter larger if possible and mounted upon a slender wooden stand the stand and crystal should be placed against a background of black felt or cloth and the crystal should be shaded with more cloth of the same character so that there is no high light anywhere upon it that is no point upon which the sun's rays fall making it a bright spot if the outlines of the ball appear a little cloudy and uncertain owing to the semi-darkness this will often help matters place yourself in front of the ball your eyes being about a foot from its surface you should be seated in a comfortable chair your eyes shaded from the light and relaxed in body and quiet in mind gaze steadily at the crystal for a few minutes do not strain or focus the eyes particularly upon any part of the ball or try to see into its interior do not blink the eyes more than you can help at the same time do not strain them by trying to keep them open for any length of time without blinking do not let your eyes wander from the ball nor your attention relax from the subject in hand do not let your eyes stare vacantly but look intently at the ball without undue strain or concentration Try not to think of anything in particular during the process of this gazing. Make the mind fairly blank. At the same time, do not allow yourself to become sleepy or the mind to become totally blank to outside impressions. It is inadvisable to keep this up for more than five minutes at a time at first, for if you do you will find that your eyes will become strained and will water after you leave off the experiment. If this is the case, you may be sure you have continued gazing for too long a period. As an automatic writing, it is advisable, if possible, to sit at the same time every day, while developing, and for the same length of time each day. This time may be lengthened as you progress, though it is usually found unnecessary to look into the crystal for more than a few minutes at a time, for you cannot get consistent, long-drawn-out visions as you can automatic writing. Explanation of Crystal Gazing Crystal gazing depends largely upon the ability possessed by the psychic to visualize or express in pictorial form thoughts and images which arise from the subconscious mind the majority of crystal visions are of this character you must not assume that because you see figures in the ball that these figures are really in that place that is that they are objective or external and exist within the crystal no they are mental pictures or hallucinations but they are expressed or externalized in this way for example you may think of a friend's face and bring it up vividly before your mind's eye as a memory picture now in ordinary life the process of externalization ends there but if you are a good visualizer you can carry it further and actually project into the crystal the picture of your thought placing it in the ball where you will see your friend's face clearly reflected from within its depths but your friend is not really in the ball it is merely your mental conception or picture of him nearly all crystal visions are of this character as before said supernormal crystal visions 
Crystal visions, however, often contain information and messages which the sitter could not possibly have known normally, and which are conveyed to him by this means. For instance, you may look into the ball one day, and see, acted before you in the crystal vision, a tragedy in which some friend of yours plays a part. You know nothing whatever about this, yet later on you receive from this friend a letter, telling you of the details of the tragedy in question. Your vision has proved correct. It is authentic and supernormal in character. Thus you will see that crystal visions are more than mere empty visions or hallucinations. The character and content of these pictures often convey striking information, and they may be telepathic, clairvoyant, or premonitory, just as dreams are. Or they may represent genuine spirit messages conveyed from some deceased friend or relative. It is no unknown thing to see words written in the ball as though you were reading handwriting. A friend of mine once looked into her crystal ball and saw within it a newspaper notice of the death of her dearest friend. She was totally ignorant of the fact, and only learned it later on. This same lady, who is a writer, has the power of projecting or placing in the crystal, at will, figures or scenes which she conjures up before her, and when they are in the ball, they will continue acting out the parts assigned to them, just as they would in a dream, for the figures seen in the crystal are not inert and motionless, but move about and appear to have life and motion of their own. On many occasions when this lady placed the characters of a novel she was writing into the crystal by an effort of will, she was enabled to see them there, and they frequently enacted certain scenes which gave her a good idea for the continuation of the plot of the story. In such a case, you will see, crystal gazing performed a very useful and practical service. How to develop the power. You may develop the power of visualizing in yourself, which is extremely important, by such simple imagination exercises as the following. Ask yourself a question such as, What was the color of Mother Hubbard's dog? Was Jack the giant killer dark or fair? Was Helen of Troy tall or small and slender? Such questions as these should bring up before your mind's eye an immediate answer in the form of a mental picture of the person or event in question and if they do not do so, you may be sure that your power of visualizing is not good and will have to be developed before you can have clear crystal visions. If your power of visualizing is extremely good, you will probably be enabled, after a certain length of time, to dispense with the ball altogether and see your visions upon a white or black background by concentrating upon it, and finally anywhere in space that you may choose to induce them. When you have arrived at this stage of development, however, you are very far along the path of successful mediumship. Clouding and Visualization If you are to obtain crystal visions, you will probably notice that, just before the vision appears, the ball will cloud over as though a blackish-gray mist were filling it, or were interposed between your eyes and it. This clouding, as it is called, is well known, and is a symptom of oncoming visions. If after sitting for five minutes every day for a couple of weeks, you do not obtain any visions at all, you may rest assured that you are a very poor visualizer and will probably not succeed in this direction. You might try, however, one simple experiment for a few days longer. Gaze at a bright and highly colored object upon which the light is falling for about a minute. Then close your eyes for a few seconds and then look at the ball. If you are ever to see anything, you should, after a few attempts, see within the ball a duplicate of the object you have been looking at in its complementary colors. It is asserted by a certain school of occultists that the visions seen within the crystal are not invariably subjective or hallucinatory, but are real entities, and that the figures have an independent existence apart from the seer. This, however, is a complicated question which is unsuitable for a primary book of instruction upon psychic development, such as the present. It will therefore be omitted from consideration with this brief mention. Shell Hearing if you place to your ear two large conch shells, you will hear a peculiar rushing or roaring sound as of the sea in the far distance. This is only natural, and probably due to the air within its cavities and the resounding properties of the various curves of the shell. So far all is simple enough, but many persons, who are slightly psychic, as soon as they place the shells to their ears, hear distinct and characteristic sounds, usually in the form of whispered or spoken words. These words may be inarticulate, they may be incoherent like dreams, they may repeat your own name time after time, or they may convey systematic and definite messages. 
as in the case of crystal gazing dreams and automatic writing shell hearing is a method of externalizing or expressing in outward form the thoughts and auditory messages of the subconscious mind but they may be more than this they may at times embody telepathic clairvoyant or premonitory messages or they may represent genuine spirit communication it all depends on the content of the message and upon the character of the words spoken just as in planchette writing if you obtain a jumble of nonsense you may be sure that it is the product of your own subconscious activity but if you obtain a characteristic and direct message you may have reason to believe it emanates from the friend it purports to proceed from in shell hearing it is the same important warnings and advice if the messages are nonsensical they should be disregarded if on the other hand they are interesting clear-cut and are proved to be correct you should regard them as possibly genuine mediumistic messages and they should be judged and valued by you accordingly in all cases of this character here as elsewhere you must use your own critical judgment and common sense upon the messages you receive shell hearing is certainly one of the clearest at the same time one of the most pleasant methods of receiving communications that can be employed the voices which you hear may be recognizable or unrecognizable it is the former that are a good proof of authenticity they may develop by themselves or emerge from a confused babble of sound unrecognized voices will often utter warnings or convey information of this character human voices are not always heard in the shell but occasional musical and other sounds which cannot easily be described finally an important warning should be heeded if after discontinuing shell hearing you continue to hear voices you should immediately drop all experiments for some days as this phenomenon of insistent voices is one of the first symptoms of danger as long as the manifestations are well controlled you may feel that you are on the safe road and developing as you should but if they begin to get beyond your control you should stop shell hearing for some time until you have strengthened your inner self to such an extent that you think it advisable to continue experimenting again in this direction end of chapter 17 recording by amanda friday chapter 18 of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hereward Carrington. Chapter 18 Spiritual Healing. Spiritual healing means that mentally or physically sick persons may be, and are, healed by the power of a spiritual energy operating through the body of a certain medium or more or less directly without his agency it is distinct from hypnotism mesmerism magnetic healing faith cure mind cure or any other kind of healing whatever and must not be confused with them all these other curative measures depend upon suggestion or upon the hidden and unknown powers of the human body to effect the cure but spiritual healing is more direct it is not the medium who heals in this case but a form of spiritual energy which operates through him what is spiritual healing spiritual healing is effected in various ways as the following definitions adopted by the national spiritualist association will show a by the spiritual influences working through the body of the medium and thus infusing curative stimulating and vitalizing fluids and energy into the diseased parts of the patient's body b by the spiritual influences illuminating the brain of the healing medium and thereby intensifying the perception of the medium so that the case nature and seat of the disease in the patient become known to the medium and the herb or other remedy which will benefit the patient also becomes known to the medium c through the application of absent treatments whereby spiritual beings combine their own healing forces with the magnetism and vitalizing energy of the medium and convey them to the patient who is distant from the medium and cause them to be absorbed by the system of the patient it will be seen that these definitions not only cover the facts of spiritual healing but also absent treatment and psychic diagnosis advice is given on numerous occasions by the spirits as to the exact course of treatment to be followed 
from all this it will be seen that spiritual healing is not only very different from any other kind of healing but that it is also far more inclusive and more wonderful how cures are affected the principle upon which spiritual healing is said to be based is simply this a certain vital and magnetic energy is contained in every living body in health this is large in quantity and in disease this stock becomes depleted ordinarily the only way to recover this lost vitality and energy is to rest sleep and take care of the body and mind that this vital energy again fills and recharges it to the same extent as before but this is a slow and uncertain process it is however the only sure way we know stimulants etc which apparently add strength to the body do not do so in reality they abstract it faster when we expend it faster we are under the delusion that we are stronger but ultimately we are weaker in the case of spiritual healing on the other hand it is very different vital energy is imparted to the system from without it fills the nerve centers and literally adds new life to the whole body these nerve centers being aroused the various functions of the body are stimulated in turn and in this manner the patient is cured the cosmic vital energy this vital energy which is imparted by means of spiritual healing is a great cosmic power which pervades the whole universe it is everywhere it is back of every phenomenon in it we live and move and have our being it is illimitable in extent and in power we simply have to draw upon it to the extent we can and the more we can draw the more rapidly do we become well the speedier the cure there is no reason to suppose that if we could tap this great reservoir in the right way we should not become well instantly and indeed there are many cases of this character where apparently this has been done instances of so-called miraculous cures being of this nature we must learn to tap the source of spiritual energy and when we have reached this inexhaustible fountain then health and strength are ours healing miracles the facts of spiritual healing are as old as history the laying on of hands was one of the most ancient modes of treatment and was employed by the egyptians christ employed it frequently when a woman touched the hem of his garment and he perceived that the virtue had gone out of him he doubtless felt a loss of the precious vital magnetism by means of which he effected his marvellous cures the healing miracles in the new testament are full of cases of this character and in our own day we often read of wondrous cures effected by those who have somehow learned to come in touch with a higher power some source of energy not available to all of us and to draw upon it for the purpose of their healing miracles to a certain extent doubtless we draw upon this fund during our sleep but it may be drawn upon in far larger quantities by those who have the secret of how to do so some spiritual healers can do this but discarnate spirits can apparently direct and manipulate this vital energy far more effectively and to better purpose for the reason that living as they do in the world of spiritual energy they understand more of its laws and can better control and govern them hence they can effect a cure very often when every other means has failed possible explanation of such cures while it is true that most cures depend upon this vitalizing magnetic current it is possible that in certain cases actual physical transformation are effected there are many cases on record in which actual tissue has been replaced apparently instantaneously by some extraordinary means in these cases it is possible that the spiritual energy has actually built up a part of the body out of matter and the vital forces which were employed materialized it in fact and left this part of the body whole and sound as before to those who believe in the reality of materialization that human bodies of flesh and blood can be built up out of invisible elements there is nothing incredible in this suggestion but it is only advanced as a tentative and possible explanation of certain facts which have to date received no explanation whatever how to draw upon the cosmic energy the great question is how are we to draw upon this great store of energy if we are alone how effect a cure within ourselves and if you are a medium how cultivate and develop the power of drawing upon this cosmic energy to such an extent that cures may thereby be effected through or by the means of your instrumentality let us take the former question first we will suppose you are alone with no one near to help you you desire to be helped and cured by spiritual means what are you to do in the first place you must learn how to relax 
if your muscles are tense and rigid you will never receive any influx of spiritual energy you shut it out since the receptive attitude is the only one in which this energy can be obtained so you must ensure complete muscular relaxation it may be obtained as follows lie on a hard couch with no support for the head relax all over as completely as possible then think of your neck you will probably find it tense and stiff when your attention is turned upon it and that you are holding your head on your shoulders relax it allowing the head to sink into the couch and support it when you have done this thoroughly think of your right arm and relax that then the left arm then the right leg then the left leg and finally the whole trunk after you have encircled the body in this way two or three times you will be well relaxed and you must then begin your breathing exercises breathe slowly and regularly inhaling from the diaphragm not the chest breathe through the nose as before explained keep up these breathing exercises for five minutes expanding the lungs and seeing to it that you have plenty of fresh air this will be quite enough for the first day or two and it is inadvisable to try any more you will arise refreshed and invigorated as the result of your exercise progressive exercises on the third day you may begin your mental practices when breathing with every breath you take in think to yourself i am power i am strength i am health i am well etc keep this up for three or four minutes concentrating upon it and really believing it then rest quietly for a minute or two then quietly and hopefully call upon this spiritual energy to cure you remember the more completely you can give yourself up to the influences which come to help and cure you the more completely and rapidly will you be cured send out a mental call for help and assistance and it will surely come to you the function of the vital body spiritual healing depends very largely upon the fact that the physical body can be acted upon and influenced from higher spheres and planes of activity through or by means of the vital or etheric body which inhabits the physical body this inner body acts as a sort of medium or vehicle through which the cosmic energy flows and the problem is to connect up this inner body both with the physical body on the one hand and with the great reservoir of spiritual energy on the other it must be admitted that we do not know exactly how this is done in the present age of the world's spiritual evolution if we did we should be enabled to perform almost miraculous cures instantly resembling those of christ who doubtless possessed a wonderful knowledge of these laws if the law is to be discovered at all it is doubtless along these lines experiment therefore and when you hit upon certain positive results you may be sure that you have discovered a portion of the great truth do not assume however on that account that you have the whole truth for you will make a great mistake if you do how to become a spiritual healer now let us suppose that you are a medium and that you are treating someone else you desire to gain this power and to obtain assistance from the spirit world this is how you should proceed you must first of all see to it that you are in good physical health if you are not your vital magnetism is apt to be tainted and injure the patient further as you often draw the patient's ills from his body into yours you must be in good health to do this next your mind must be receptive sympathetic and in an attitude of kindly helpfulness if you feel selfish this at once sets up a barrier or wall which you will be unable to break through finally your psychic sensitiveness and mediumship must be developed to a certain extent to enable you to practice this phase with any hope of success the methods which you must follow to increase your mediumistic power have been explained in some of the previous chapters and will be more fully explained in those which follow now assuming that you have your patient before you place your hands on his forehead and make gentle strokings then place one hand on his forehead and one on his solar plexus take a number of deep breaths asking your patient to close his eyes and breathe with you in perfect rhythm in this way you get into unison and sympathy then make yourself negative and ask the spiritual power to come and help and assist you in your process of cure make yourself a channel for it you will feel tingling sensations in your arms and the patient will feel them in his body this is the beginning of the process try to find just the right mental and spiritual attitude and power will certainly come from day to day your ability to draw upon the great cosmic energy will increase you will get greater and greater power and as this develops 
you will be able to handle and control it more and more. Your power as a spiritual healer will in this manner increase from day to day. End of chapter 18. Recording by Amanda Friday. Chapter 19 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Karaz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harold Carrington. Chapter 19 The Cultivation of Sensitiveness. Sensitiveness means the ability to sense or perceive in some subtle manner auras, impressions, and influences, either issuing from another living person or from some thing or emanating from spirits. And so far as a sensitive or medium can sense or feel these influences, he is a psychic. And the cultivation of this power is, in a sense, the essence of all true progress in mediumship. This is, therefore, one of the most important lessons which can be learned. For as you progress in psychic sensitiveness, you also progress in mediumship, other things being equal. The first chapter of this book was devoted to development, but that only gave the outward form, as it were, of the process, and did not enter in any way fully into its essence. We cannot pretend to do so even in this chapter, since the subject is too vast and too delicate. But I may take the student some distance further along the road, for after he has mastered the preceding chapters, he will be more enabled to undertake these exercises than he was at the beginning of his development. How to Distinguish True from False one of the greatest difficulties, doubtless, in the cultivation of sensitiveness is how to distinguish true from false, hallucination from reality. At first, this will doubtless be next to impossible, and many false steps will have to be taken before you find, from actual bitter experience, what is true and what is not. But as the inner sense becomes developed, you will find that it not only gives you the knowledge in question, but that it also enables you to distinguish one from the other, true from false and illuminates the whole subject so that mistake is almost impossible. This certainty, which you will then have, cannot be communicated to another. It is often impossible to prove to one who does not experience this inner vision of reality that what you receive is true, nonetheless. As Mr. Charles Brent says in his Sixth Sense, the serious crux is how, in the realm of the spiritual and the physically intangible, to distinguish between the real and the seeming, the true and the false. This is the function of the mystic sense to do, aided by the full complement of inner faculties. In a measure, the mystic sense, like the bodily senses, acts automatically. But like them, it needs special training in order to separate phantasm from reality, to determine values, and to grade and classify ideals until they reveal themselves to be ordered unity, not less but more mysterious because more intelligible to the whole man. It is because of all this that long training in psychic development is necessary, and sudden jumps or leaps into full possession of this knowledge is impossible. The first step. The first thing to do in cultivating your inner sensitiveness is to stimulate your physical senses to the point of their highest activity. Endeavor to perceive and feel vibrations unfelt by others, for much depends upon vibration. Train your senses. Then train yourself in seeing auras and in psychometry, as before explained. In this way, getting further along the road. Try to see and to feel the emanation coming from people you meet. Look at them steadily and see whether you cannot discover a sort of hot air or vaporous emanation issuing from their bodies and radiating out into space. As soon as you have succeeded in this, begin to analyze your feelings and emotions and interpret them. Do this, one, when you touch the person in question, two, when you receive a letter from him, which you should hold in your hand or between both hands, three, when you hear him speak, and four, when you merely see him. When trying these experiments, assume a listening attitude, as before explained, and breathe slowly and deeply. This breathing must not be too conscious, so as to take your attention, however. Relax yourself as much as possible during this period. Try in the dark or semi-dark at first, in the light later on. Psychic Atmosphere When you are walking along the street, cultivate the practice of sensing persons and seeing their aura. You will soon be able to feel a sort of air or atmosphere about each individual, 
just as there is a definite air or atmosphere about a house or a town. Thus, a manufacturing town has quite a different atmosphere from one which is not. You will soon be able to get this in a general manner. After you have progressed thus far, you should endeavor to feel any cuts, bruises, pains, etc., which may be upon a person's body. You should do this at first by passing your open hands gently over the surface of the body, and as soon as you come to a spot which is sensitive and sore, you will feel a slight pain in your own body in the corresponding place. Before you are able to do this with much success, however, you should develop certain phases of psychometry, as for instance the following. Make a number of small paper packages, all exactly alike in appearance. In these place salt, pepper, mustard, cloves, nutmeg, sugar, cayenne, etc. Mix these all up so you cannot tell which is which. Now practice feeling or handling these until you can tell the contents of any given package by merely feeling the paper in which it was wrapped. As soon as you have done this, you are ready for more advanced practices. Having progressed thus far, you are in a position to try your first experiments in psychic diagnosis. Pass your hands over the body of your patient, who should be divested of as many clothes as possible, and if your sensitiveness has begun to develop, you will feel a pain or some sensation in your hand or arm, or in some corresponding part of your own body, as you reach the disease spot in your patient's body. Cultivate this until you can succeed with more or less certainty and precision. The more you practice this, the more perfect you will become, and the more rapid your advancement will be. When you have reached this stage, you must go one step further. Having located the seat of the trouble and its general nature, you must seek to know how to cure it. Hold the mind in a receptive attitude when doing this, and you will soon begin to receive the distinct impression that you must do something for the patient, but you will not know as yet what it is. After a little time, you will get the distinct impression what to do to make certain passes or manipulations, to prescribe a certain drug, to apply certain water applications, etc. As soon as you have reached this stage, you are on the high road to becoming a successful spiritual healer, and your power will develop with every sitting. It would be well for you at this stage to sit by yourself, especially for development in this direction. An added power will doubtless be given you with which to work your cures. Progressive Exercises in Self-Development it may be, however, that you do not care to develop your sensitiveness in this direction. You wish only to develop it for your own progress, and not for the purpose of becoming a healer at all. In that case, you must follow a slightly different method of development, though all the exercises we have described will be found helpful and advantageous. If you desire to cultivate your own sensitiveness, the following exercises will be found very useful in this connection. 1. Try to analyze your own emotions when in the presence of A, a large company of people, and B, a small gathering. You will probably find that your impressions are very different and that a large crowd will give you the impression of being more scattered in mind than a small one. In other words, you will begin to sense or feel the mind of the crowd. It is well known that such a thing exists, for crowds will often do things and perform actions which no individual in it would perform alone. If you can sense this mind of the crowd, your sensitiveness is progressing favorably and rapidly. 2. Stand before a mirror. See whether or not you are enabled to perceive any influence coming from your reflected image in the mirror. Many sensitive persons can do this, and the more sensitive you are, the more you can feel this. You will sense a magnetic fluid coming from the reflected form in the mirror. 3. If you are in the habit of sleeping with anyone regularly, Endeavor to analyze the impressions you receive from the aura emanating from the body of the person with whom you may be sleeping. See whether this is positive or negative. Positive aura is slightly warm. Negative aura is somewhat cold. 4. Hold your right hand above a mirror, then the left hand. Try to feel whether one hand feels cooler than the other, or whether both are of equal temperature. The hand which is warmest is on the more positive side of the body. 5. Close your eyes and have someone make magnetic passes over your head and shoulders. Try to tell whether those passes are being made in an upward or downward direction. Downward passes are positive or sleeping passes. Upward passes are negative or waking passes. 6. Procure several metals, such as copper, iron, tin, zinc, etc. 
place your hand over each in turn and ascertain the different impressions you get from each one. Then wrap them in separate pieces of paper, making all alike in appearance, and see whether you can always tell the correct metal from feeling the paper. Then place your open hand over the paper without touching it. Next, remove your hand gradually further and further away until you are some distance from the metal. After a time, you should be enabled to do all this from a considerable distance. It is only an extension of this power which enables dowsers or metal and water finders to locate the whereabouts of metal and water under the ground by walking over the spot above the ground with hands outstretched or with a divining or dowsing rod held in their hands. 7. Always have flowers in your sleeping room. They are a good influence. Analyze the difference between your impressions when the flowers are removed and when they are in the room. Colors and Emotions 8. Procure some watercolors and paint solid strips of color on a piece of white paper. Make these about a half an inch broad and three inches long. On one piece, paint a bright red strip, on another a vivid blue, on another emerald green, on another black, etc. Blindfold your eyes. Shuffle the papers and then place your hand on the topmost one and see whether you can tell from your impressions what color you are touching. Red will give you a sensation of warmth light blue of cold, etc., as explained in the chapter devoted to color and its interpretation. 9. Try to cultivate what is known as sensitiveness to psychic contagion. You must remember that thoughts and emotions are just as contagious as diseases, and that you can catch them in just the same way. When in the company of other persons, therefore, endeavor to catch or feel their emotions and feelings. You will probably get at first the thoughts, etc., they are expressing, then those which they are just about to express, so that you take the words out of their mouths. Then you will begin to sense the feelings and emotions of the speaker before they are put into words. Finally, you will be enabled to appreciate his whole feeling and thinking self by a species of intuition or impression. Endeavor to draw this out of your subject, and do not let it come to you without any effort on your part. Be active, that is, instead of merely passive. In this way lies safety and success. The Expression of Impressions Received 10. Finally, you must teach yourself to express what you feel. Often this is most difficult. You may feel a thing and feel inclined to say it, but something seems to hold you back until it is too late. Overcome this restrictive feeling. It is important you should do so, for this is one of the most important things to learn in the cultivation of mediumship. When you have learned to express your impressions, you have progressed far along the road. These practices in the cultivation of sensitiveness are the most valuable you can have as a preparation for the cultivation of true mediumship. At the same time, they are safe exercises to follow. Practice them, therefore, before you attempt any definitely mediumistic exercises, and you will be rewarded by a safe and sane increase of your inner spiritual faculties. End of chapter 19 Recording by Alex Caraz, New York Chapter 20 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter 20 Trance. Trance is a condition into which certain mediums enter in order to receive messages and give them in the form of speaking or writing. No one knows at the present time what the medium trance is, or, for that matter, any other kind of trance. Dr. George Moore, in his Use of the Body in Relation to the Mind, says, Trance is a state of body sometimes produced in man, a condition utterly inexplicable by any principle taught in the schools. Professor William James stated his belief that the medium trance was different from any other trance of which we have any knowledge, and this seems to be borne out by the fact that spirit messages are given in this condition, as well as telepathic, clairvoyant, and premonitory messages of all kinds. What is trance? Both trance and catalepsy occur spontaneously. Both may also be induced artificially by hypnotism. Both are mistaken for death, and in many respects they are very similar. In catalepsy, the body is rigid, whereas in trance this is very rarely the case. 
this forming the chief mark of distinction, external indication, between the two states. What the internal differences are, we do not know. Various attempts, however, have been made to define them. Dr. Franz Hartmann, e.g., thus distinguishes them, quote, There seems hardly any limit to the time during which a person may remain in a trance, but catalepsy is due to some obstruction in the organic mechanism of the body on account of its exhausted nervous power. In the last case, the activity of life begins again as soon as the impediment is removed, or the nervous energy has recuperated its strength. End quote. Death, Its Causes and Phenomena by Harroward Carrington and John R. Meter. When a hypnotist places his subject under hypnotic control, the subject remains en rapport with the operator. The influence comes from a living person. In the medium trance, it seems possible that the operator is not a living but a deceased person, and that it is a kind of telepathic influence from spirits which induces this state. In fact, it is brought about by influence from the other side. Light and deep trance. There are all grades and degrees of trance, from the very light stage, in which there is but little difference from the ordinary waking consciousness, to that degree of deep trance, where the medium is totally unconscious of everything that passes around him. Very deep trance of this character is rare, but many of the most famous mediums have got their best messages while in that condition. The famous Mrs. Piper of Boston had almost to die, to all outward appearances, before she could enter this deep trance, and at the end of two hours or so, during which the trance lasted, the only signs of life were slow respiration and heartbeat. The only signs of consciousness were manifest in the right hand and arm, which did the automatic writing. Many test mediums and sensitives, on the other hand, pass into a stage of trance so light that no one but an expert could detect any trance at all. Yet in many such cases, no memory of the condition remains after the trance is finished. These light trances differ but slightly from cases of daydreams, absent-mindedness, etc., when we say to a person, half in joke, you are in a trance. By shades and degrees this becomes deeper, as the state becomes more profound and lower and lower layers or strata of the subconscious mind are reached. Mrs. Piper had three distinct layers of this character. The first differed slightly from the waking state. In this condition she talked. The second condition was far deeper trance, and in this stage spirits were seen instead of human beings. In the third or deepest stage, speech was usually absent, and automatic writing occurred. Spirit Control During Trance In trance, we may assume that there is a gradual and fluctuating control of the medium's mind and body by the communicating spirit, and that, as one vacates or is driven out by the invading intelligence, the latter is able to control, more and more effectually, the medium. Just as two solid bodies cannot be in the same place at the same time, so two spirit intelligences cannot occupy and control the same body at the same moment. When once the fact of spirit control is granted, the nature and character of this control remains to be solved. How does the spirit manipulate the brain and nervous mechanism of the medium to bring about the desired results? What parts of the brain are used, and how? These and many similar questions remain to be answered, and it may take many years of scientific research before we are enabled to answer queries such as these with any degree of confidence. The Difference Between Somnambulism and Trance The difference between somnambulism and the medium trance seems to be that in the former we remain en rapport with ourselves, and in the latter we are in touch with the spirit world. Many mediums who give inspirational messages or lectures from the platform are in a condition of light trance, and children have been known to pass into this condition and give a large amount of valuable information unknown to their seniors and which certainly could not have been known to themselves. Properly managed, the trance condition is not harmful, though it may become so in the hands of blundering persons. The spiritualist's manual gives four chief reasons why the trance state should not be harmful to those who enter it. These are Various methods of conveying information during trance. 1. The intelligences acting upon them, the mediums, are almost invariably of a superior character, and therefore must mold the organism by constant use for the expression of higher forms of thought. 2. 
the relation of the medium to the manifesting intelligence is that of pupil to teacher sometimes that of a child to a wise and loving parent and sometimes both these relations combined with a subtle and ennobling spirituality three there is always a mutual spiritual relation even though the medium is not humanly conscious of it and no one can be a medium for the perfect expression of spiritual messages or discourses who does not consent to the procedure and cooperate with the manifesting spirit four as the master musician improves the instrument he plays upon so also a spirit controlling a human organism for the purpose of expressing wholesome thought imparts a greater power both to the brain and spirit of the medium it is often difficult for spirits to control a medium sufficiently to manifest in any way through him different types of control there are various types of control which are used by spirits in trance mediumship a there is the telepathic method in which the thought is conveyed direct to the mind of the medium who is sufficiently awake in light trance to receive this thought and give it out to the sitter in speech or writing b there is the picture or pictographic method in which the spirits present certain images or pictures to the clairvoyant eye of the medium and these pictures are seen and interpreted either directly or symbolically c there is the sense impression method in which general sensations or impressions are conveyed to the medium who takes on the condition of the communicating spirit describes pains felt in various parts of the body etc as the case may be d there is the direct control method in which the spirit apparently removes the medium's own spirit more or less from the body in deep trance and manipulates it as he would an instrument by acting upon the nervous system direct in much the same way that we act upon our own nervous systems throughout life this latter method is very rare and is only found in cases of very deep trance doubtless there are other methods which spirits employ at times and probably combine all the above on occasion but these are the most distinctive methods and they are the ones which may be seen more readily than any others in cases of trance mediumship in cases of so-called ecstasy the spirit of the medium obtains the information himself either by clairvoyant vision or by partially separating itself from the body and visiting the spiritual world direct the visions which are obtained in ecstasy are thus descriptive of the spiritual world and what is happening there and for this reason most of the revelations so-called are ecstatic visions more or less symbolic the best way to enter trance many persons cannot enter trance spontaneously but have to be mesmerized by another person before this condition is brought about even andrew jackson davis was mesmerized for years before he could develop spontaneous trance so that he could enter it at will this may be one of the best ways for the beginner to begin his trance mediumship but you should take care that the person who mesmerizes you is of a suitable temperament and in every way fitted and qualified to do so if he is not you are liable to attract to yourself spirits of a lower order and then you will bring to yourself lying and malevolent spirits and you may induce a case of so-called obsession however if the operator is harmonious and qualified for his task he will not only prevent this but would see you through more safely than if you enter this condition spontaneously and by yourself trance is very closely akin to some cases of suspended animation to certain yoga trance conditions and even death itself which has been called its twin brother as we have seen however it differs from all these very widely spontaneous trance is doubtless the most commonly experienced and is the one which you should endeavor to cultivate in yourself other things being equal during these conditions as you develop many odd and striking phenomena will doubtless become manifest to you if your hand writes automatically you will probably note that it becomes more or less sensitive or anesthetic as explained in the chapter on automatic writing if speech is induced as the result of trance this may be striking and coherent or quite possibly mere nonsense and gibberish if the latter develops you may be sure that something is wrong and you should strive to ascertain what this condition is and correct it if possible here as elsewhere you must be careful and exercise your own judgment and discretion on the messages received and not to accept all these as absolute truth for if you do you are likely to be greatly deceived especially at the beginning of your mediumship where everything is faulty and difficult 
the clearer the communications generally speaking the surer the messages but those coming through what might be called amateur mediums are to be trusted only when they have been verified how to experiment with the trance you may experiment with your own trance condition profitably in the following manner sit with pencil in hand for automatic writing and induce one or more friends of yours to do the same thing at the same time see whether there is any connection between your writings when they are compared the next day in many instances where this has been tried striking coincidental messages have been received partly through one medium and partly through another they thus tend to confirm each other and show that the same spirit intelligence is active and manifesting through both mediums at the same time almost or one directly after the other how to enter trance by yourself in order to induce trance spontaneously in yourself you should proceed more or less as follows begin by gazing for some time at a bright object such as a reflected light coming from a mirror crystal ball etc this will tend to tire the eyes and nerves slightly and bring about a dazed condition which is usually the beginning of trance while looking at the bright object breathe deeply and regularly through the nose and from the diaphragm as explained before in chapter six you must not let this distract your attention however as all the bodily processes should be unconscious if you have already practiced deep breathing as before explained you should by this time be so far advanced that you can do so at will without consciously thinking of it while looking at the bright object do not concentrate or think of anything in particular beyond keeping yourself conscious and remembering all the time that you are yourself that you are not leaving your body and that you are not going to become totally unconscious during this process the room should be as quiet as possible though some monotonous sound such as the ticking of a large clock might assist matters do not listen to this consciously however abolish all feelings of fear and all anxiety as such mental states will effectually prevent you from entering the trance condition let yourself go and develop as far as possible symptoms of early trance mediumship you must not imagine that the beginnings of your mediumship will be either profitable or pleasant because they probably will not be nearly all successful mediums will tell you that they have passed through a period at the beginning of their mediumship when they thought themselves in danger and believed that their minds were being impaired for the time being this however passes off as you progress provided that you progress along the right road at the beginning of your mediumship and this you should endeavor in every way to do if you can consult an experienced medium or still better if you can sit with him during your development or induce him to be present during your psychic unfoldment things will be far easier for you and far safer than they would be otherwise the oncoming of trance is often signified by certain physical and psychical manifestations which must not alarm you when they appear as they sometimes but not always do hiccoughs sudden and spasmodic pains and cramps a feeling of all goneness nausea flashes of light or the sensation of faintness and that everything is turning black before you these are a few of the symptoms which you are liable to experience during your early development and though they may not be pleasant you had better be warned of them in advance and not be alarmed when they appear sometimes however none of these signs are manifest only a delightful sensation of falling asleep upon a bed of roses in these cases the psychic has developed himself properly and systematically and his guides or controls are also wise and helpful these are the fortunate but unhappily rare cases but it is hoped that by following the advice given in this book many more will be enabled to develop in this wholesome manner the three rules to follow there are three chief and most essential factors to be considered one your mental and physical health must be quite up to the standard if you are depleted exhausted or run down physically if you are suffering from any disease or if on the other hand you are full of fear apprehension and doubts or if anger and similar thoughts rage in your soul you may anticipate a difficult time in your development and unpleasant experiences throughout that slow process two you should be careful to keep your self-consciousness active and alert when entering trance do not give yourself up completely or allow the mind to become a blank at first give yourself up in every other way but this 
you must always keep in the background of your mind the thought, I am I, I am so and so, your name. I will remain in my body, I am strength and power. I will not be influenced against my will by forces other than good. I can always return to myself when I want to. These and similar suggestions you must give to yourself and hold them in your mind as a central point of force while entering trance, even while allowing yourself to become passive in every other way. If you do this, you will avoid a great deal of difficulty and danger. 3. If you can in any way assure yourself that you have a band of spirits or controls on the other side who are ready and willing to help you, this would mean much. A good medium or clairvoyant could probably tell you whether this is the case and the nature of the intelligences who are trying to influence and act upon you. If these are described as evil, you had best postpone your development until this condition changes. If, on the contrary, they are described as good and helpful, you may proceed, subject to the above precautions and advice. Important Conditions to be Fulfilled It is important to have a plentiful supply of fresh air in the room when entering trance, and after you are in that condition. Also, the light should be so regulated as to affect you most agreeably. This may be semi-darkness, though many trance mediums develop in full light. Soft music may be found beneficial in some cases, though not in all. You should have everything ready to hand, such as pencils, paper, etc., before you enter the trance condition. During the trance state, you will probably be more or less sensitive to objects placed in your hands. That is, you will be enabled not only to psychometrize them, but in connection with the objects given you, you will get spirit messages and information concerning the individuals to whom they formerly belonged. All objects of this character carry the aura or influence of the person with whom they have come into contact, and for this reason, those objects which have been next the skin are the best for this purpose. Gloves, headbands, etc. are especially valuable. These should be wrapped, as before explained, in oil silk and they should be handled as little as possible after the death of the person to whom they belonged. Developing Exercises A very good practice in developing trance mediumship in yourself is to cultivate the habit of analyzing your own falling asleep process. Try to catch yourself as you fall asleep, and hold on to yourself when in this semi-sleeping condition as long as you can before finally dropping off to slumber. This you will find very difficult at first, but it can be mastered more or less in time. If you can succeed in catching yourself in this manner when nearly asleep and retaining a certain degree of conscious control, you may rest assured that you will not only be a good trance medium, but that you will be able to protect yourself while in the trance state, and that harm can hardly come to you when in this condition. This is a very excellent practice and has given many psychics that power over themselves which they formerly lacked. Spiritual repose is essential for the trance medium who would develop simply, harmoniously, into practical and wise mediumship. In this manner, you are said to come in tune or harmony with the great cosmic currents of truth and wisdom which flow hither and thither in our world, and to and fro from the spiritual source of love, wisdom, and intelligence. Once get into harmony with this stream, and your progress, not only as a medium, but as a supreme psychic, is assured. End of chapter 20